This episode of the Inside Running Podcast is proudly brought to you by New Balance. The global athletic leader is proud to introduce a new premium stability shoe within their Fresh Foam X range, the Vongo V5. The Vongo V5 builds upon the success of the perfectly cushioned 1080 version 11 with the addition of an innovative stability solution designed for the perfect blend of support and softness. The Fresh Foam Vongo V5 is available now at select retailers and www.newbalance.com. Welcome to episode number 199 of the Inside Running Podcast. Thank you for joining us for another week. Uh, not too big of a show this week compared to last week. Last week was a big one, but looking forward to uh, having your attention, uh, streaming, downloading the show for uh, this week's episode. Welcome to my co-host, Dan in Anglesey, Julian Spence. How are you going? I'm pretty good, thank you. That's good. And welcome to my other co-host, uh, Bradley Croker. Welcome to this week's episode. Thanks, Brady. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Just saying off air, it's the first time we've recorded with the video on. I'm a bit thrown early on, but it's good to see your faces, boys. I'm a bit the same, actually. I thought it would be okay. It was your yeah. idea, Brad. Are we going to turn, turn the videos off then? Feels real awkward. Yeah, can we? You can't do All something right. 198 ways one certain way. I'm going to water. I'm struggling with this video oh. turned on. You're too, right. you're too good looking, Brad. Video's off. <laughs> Ah, uh, we can leave them on. I think I'm... Oh, okay. We we'll turned them off. Um, boys, what's been happening? Julian, tell me first out what's been happening down your way. Well, recently, over the weekend, obviously, Regional Vic went back into lockdown. So, um, so uh, yeah, close the store halfway through the day and, and go back into lockdown protocol, which is, I think it's, what, sixth or seventh time we've done that now? Maybe the seventh time Regional's gone in. Uh, so yeah, we got the protocols down now. We sort of know what to do, and doesn't make it any less enjoyable, or in the days or hours leading up, any less anxious about what's going to happen. The, un- the unpredictability is the, just the worst of it. But you we, kind um, of uh, knew it was coming, though, and prepared for it. Yeah, well, I think I. I'm not sure whether I said on here, but I was saying to everyone else. We f- feel like we we're on borrowed time the whole time. Like it was just a bonus that we could open. And we kind of took it, took it like that. Like every day we were open was, was um, yeah, just a bonus. So now we're closed like everyone else. Yeah, well, yeah, a lot of people in the same boat, including Brad the Croker. How's your week of lockdown being, Croaks? Uh, not too bad. Like, I was pretty down in the dumps at the start of the week, like when we recorded last week. But um, then we sort of teed up to, you know, interview Sinead and then organised to interview Pat Tin and later in the week. So... That sort of got me up and about a little bit, just knowing that there's a little bit more purpose to the week, and um, and now I'm sort of settled into to lockdown life. Um, yeah, so you sort of forget what day it is after a while, but yeah, no no complaints from here. Um, yeah, from mine, doing like I'm not really doing any sessions. I'm just sort of running, and I'll probably do that for another week, and then uh, look at starting back again with maybe a bit more structure. Mm, probably done you good, have a bit of a break as well. Yeah, it's been good just to reset yeah. a bit. 
Um, well, you want to tell us about your running week? Start from Monday. Yeah. All right. So Monday, um, yeah, 45 minutes, 4.17s. Uh, Tuesday, the hour. Um, got rolling a little bit towards the end, like a few sort of 350s, um, so 406 average there for an hour. Uh, still kept up my midweek long run on the Wednesday. So that was uh, 20K, um, 405s. Then had a couple of a couple of lighter days, 45 minutes on the Thursday at 414s. Uh, 60 minutes on the Friday at 4.19s. Um, Saturday, 45 minutes at 4.17s. And then Sunday, I um, because I decided that I was going to have two weeks of jogging, I thought, well, I might as well just not do a super long run and just cut that back a bit as well. But um, I think the fact that I had like a pretty easy week I got rolling pretty early on this run, so it ended up turning into a bit of a, a long run with like a bit of tempo at the end. Like I reckon the last six or seven k were probably mid mid three forty. So I did ninety minutes at three fifty eight average. So that was that was a, definitely a solid run. Um, so my week total was one hundred and three, and like technically we're meant to only exercise an hour a day, but um, like my my total week was seven hours and nine minutes. So some some days I ran for 45 minutes, but then made it up with two longer runs on a Wednesday and a um and a Sunday. So hang on, yeah, you I, just put your own formula into this. So what's that? Are you saying an hour a day is the same as seven hours over the week? No, well, yeah, well, I guess it's that. I, you know, I like you, it. I think you're allowed right. to exercise. You're allowed to exercise for seven hours a week. <laughs> Not sure how it flies <laughs> with the restrictions though. No, but uh, anyway, so yeah, I'm going to jog again this week, and then. Um, I think from next week, I might do a light session late this week, but next week I'm just going to go back into a bit of a base phase where just do some like, um, you know, like mile reps off minute recoveries that aren't too too quick, like sort of similar to what I did that session I did with Ellie late last year where we did was it five or six, five or six by a mile off a minute where, you know, you're running 315s to 320s and it's like it's a long session, it's a long-ish session um, but it's not super taxing in terms of intensity. So I'm going to do a fair bit of that sort of stuff over the next few months because I can't just I can't see any races happening this year. So I might as well just build a bit of a base and see what happens uh, early next year. Hopefully there'll be some track races in Sydney. Will you do any strides? Yeah, actually that's one good point. I'm going to start um, doing some hill strides once a week, uh, just like 10 sec, 10 to 15 seconds. And, um, and and flat strides once a week as well, just to keep a little bit of a little bit of turnover there. Uh, also, want to start just doing a little bit more activation and and home. Like well, obviously the gyms are closed here at the moment. A bit more activation and gym work. So yeah, as much as it sort of sucked when we all went into lockdown, it sort of just I've just sort of just changed the goalposts a bit and reassessed. And um, yeah, looking forward to getting back into it next week. Yeah, you can just tell by your voice that like, you were pretty filthy even behind the scenes like this time last week. Yeah, it was like my um, it was like my season ended with Deke's quarters. Like <laughs> that was the end of the season, and then it's like, uh, but sometimes it's sometimes it's good to take two weeks of just jogging. Like, I'm certainly not going to lose any fitness running 100k a week for two weeks, um, especially with a little bit of up tempo running on a couple of times a week. Yeah, that's probably good for you. Just getting out, clearing the head, go back inside. Yep. Yeah, so I'm in a good spot. Good, Moose. What have you been doing? You in a good spot? Uh, I don't think. Oh, uh, gee, I don't know. I mean, I feel mentally I'm pretty, pretty happy with where I'm at. I've, I've been down long enough to get used to it. <laughs> That's how I would put it. You I'm mean not ex- injury down? Injury down, okay. like running down, that kind of thing. Like, uh, I'm. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, this week was it again? I'm so good at having two contrasting halves to my weeks which isn't a good thing so on the monday i ran uh with sugar down in janjuk so we ran out to bells and on this day it was the they have like a big wave contest that's on call all the time so a bunch of locals get voted into a contest that's like the bells 50 year storm contest it's a big wave event and it's pretty much on standby standby at all at all time and when the surf gets big enough they get like a call and say, hey, the contest is on today. So they all rock down and surf 
um, a big wave contest and death on a stick out there, mate. Well, well yeah, they got jobs. They, they you rock up for this one. They all do have jobs. So Tim Stevenson, he was a guy that um, he's from Jan Jack. So he was sort of my age growing up, and he he was whoa, what did he he got the best. He was he won something maybe the best ride of the day or something, um, and he worked the whole night before. And there was a there was a lady who won the best performance or so something like that. But it was, so we ran out to Bells and it was and we kind of caught a caught a bit of it. It was really cool to watch. So the, the trail I'm not sure whether you've ever run it, but it goes from it goes along the um, cliffs from Torquay up to Bells Beach. It's one of like the all-time runs. There's a fun run on it called the Bells Bash. Most people would have been on it at some point if they've been down in Torquay. And yeah, it was just a really cool day to go running because the surf was so big. Is that the track that goes near the um, tiger snake? Like, oh, uh, so that's that's probably another five or six k along the coast, and okay. then you. You drop down into like the Ironbark Basin. That's at the bottom of a thing called the Ironbark Basin. So it's not really on the same trail, but it's on the same cliff. It's just along the cliffs a little further. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, that was good. Went to the gym after it and, and then had a sauna. So got back in the sauna at this RACV. It was pretty fun. I'm big on the sauna. A little bit of heat stress helps the fitness when you're not running as much. And Tuesday was running uh up because of, before i went to um ballarat so let me click i've sort of got my thing set up a bit different I'll, oh yeah so i ran just a um couple of loops of my favorite flat loop there's not a lot of flat loops in anglesey so this is as flat as i could get 13k i ran about an hour listen to inside jogging podcast they uh they mentioned us on it I think they do it so that they hope we listen and mention them, and it's worked because I'm I'm mentioning them. Was that right. the one where they were talking about croaks is the best looking one on this show? <laughs> no, they didn't say oh, that. Yeah, they did. They were talking about how good his hair is, is and stuff. I might have to start listening. Fucking hell! Because the Sorry. guy the guy with the bleached hair he thinks he's more like croaker. That's how it come up. Hey, that bloke isn't. He has a low IQ. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, clearly not like me then. <laughs> <laughs> Clousy. Clousy seems bored as fuck the whole time. He's not interested. And the other bloke just tries to wind them up by telling them that they're stupid at training and they run. Yeah, uh, I to too high. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's sort of similar to this show, I guess. Um, That's what happens when you pretty much rip off our name and, and format. But it's good people talking about running. Hey, and we just give them a plug, didn't we? Yeah. Jeez. Mm. Uh, Send us so a slab next- of beers, boys. Next morning on the Wednesday, I did a threshold down in Ballarat. So I ran the lake, ran with Watto. This one was the heart rate. Uh, It was four by six minutes. So they weren't very long intervals, but I needed just a medium workout after I did that 10K time trial on the weekend before. So I did four by six minutes, 90 seconds jog between. Uh, Heart rates were 159, 168, 170, 172, which is pretty normal over a progression of intervals when you're running at thresh. Like you just, that there's just a lag period early on before you reach threshold. And and so on the fourth rep, you get there really quickly and stay there. So that's why I'm actually averaging my actual threshold, whereas the other ones I'm not quite. But the paces were pretty good. So I ran 313, 318, 316, 313. And that's it's a lot like, better. It's more like four by six minutes at a ten k pace, isn't it? I'm going to heart rate, big fella. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm just staring. Yeah. But you you ran ten hey. k. How many? Your heart rate's improved a lot in. Tell me what days? I should do. Should I not run to heart rate? No, it's good. It's good. So your ten k wasn't Crazy. all out then. Throw a barb in. Now you're gonna go crawl back, pick it up, and get the fuck out. <laughs> because no. Well, you ten so you ten k so thresh what threshold reps are normally what six like roughly sixty minute pace but you, and you ran a ten k threshold route. ain't a pace brother it's a heart but, rate yeah okay but you ran but relatively like this is flat where you did your ten k was flat so um, one seventy five that's pretty solid that's that's pretty high heart rate isn't it for, for threshold yeah it it's about what I sit at for most of the time I reckon if if you go back to look at my 
threshold that I did a couple of weeks ago, I ran 175 and averaged 334s, I reckon. What was your heart rate for the time trial? Did you wear it? Uh, I think I did, actually. I can look uh, that up while you keep yeah. talking. Have a yeah. look, because I reckon, well, let's see if it got much higher than 175. I it like, did. I like this argument. It did. 179, maybe? Dude, didn't you uh, pace for the first half of it? Yeah, then, yeah? Oh, so, uh, sort of. Uh, I mean, okay. I had a negative I had a negative split, so you got to give me some points Here there. There we go, 32.16. And the heart rate average was 174. Yeah, that's an average too, so... That would have been like 4K of getting up there and then just way over. Take that. Was it it 180 at 6K in? Exactly, right? 10K effort. 10K effort's a lot higher than 175. Yeah. yeah. I bet it didn't drop much from that. (laughs) No, it only kept climbing, but it pretty much stayed at the same spot. Yeah, so I'm good with motor pressure. I guess as well, like, yeah, six-minute reps aren't that long and 90-second recovery is decent, like... Yeah, that's right. And six minute reps aren't that long. Like, but geez, fucking had a good one for once. It's been a while, boys. Come on. Give us a bump. Sorry, sorry, mate. Give us a bump. This is bullshit. <laughs> I, I, thought was, I thought it was good there in front of Watto. I liked your description. I wasn't it. having a go at you. I was just no, sitting back more, listening. It was more, you've got to admit, it's a, it's a pretty impressive turnaround from like, you know, a few days earlier where. You're running, so what you ran for your six minute reps, it was basically your 10K pace, but your heart rate's a hell of a lot lower than it was, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Pro, like I said to Watto when he was wondering what was wrong with him, you're running with a 214 bloke, Ash. <laughs> <laughs> it made him feel a whole lot better. Just like if we went running, Croaks, I'd remind you, hey, just don't try to push it. You're running with a 214 bloke. Uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah anyway that was uh, that's the end of me being up and about um because <laughs> my week went real downhill after this so that afternoon i was booked in to get this prp injection which uh turned around real quick actually so i had the appointment on monday then got the referral monday night called up tuesday they said come in tomorrow so i went in Wednesday Arvo and PRP is like they get take your blood out they spin it they grab the platelets uh, or the platelet yeah the platelets like rise to the top after they spin it and then they re-inject that concentrated blood like the platelet concentrate into back into your back into your joint or your tendon or wherever you saw with the idea that it helps healing uh, so I was sitting on the bed in between my blood getting taken and them spinning it. And I, I was like, oh, I wonder how long this takes to come back from. Like, I I'd, I'd actually hadn't asked anyone. I just assumed it was like a cortisone injection. And then I sent a message firstly to Ali. I said, oh, how long should I have off? And she's like, oh, this this can sometimes be like four to five days. You can't really do anything for a week. And I was like, fucking hell, this is not what I want. I don't like. I just had the best workout in six months <laughs> this morning. I was I was seriously trying to find a way out of the clinic, in between them taking my blood and them putting it back in. Uh, but I was basically locked in there, and and I was just really disappointed when I heard that because I was going okay, and I remember finishing the the workout that morning, going, "Gee, my knee actually feels pretty bloody good, best it's felt in ages." So I ended up getting this jab and. Uh, I messaged my doctor. He he sort of said, yeah, it's kind of like a cortisone but worse, so give it an extra day or so. so probably a little bit more um, flexible than than what Ali said. And and I took off Thursday, Friday, and on Saturday I jogged 20 minutes. Sunday I jogged 40 minutes. And, yeah, it just feels like it's flared up a bit. It feels like the injections actually made it a little angrier. I just get the pain a little sharper. It comes on a bit earlier. It doesn't really go away after I finish running like it has been doing. So, um, like that that's where I expected I, that that could have that impact. Yeah, it says it might flare up sometimes. You just 
it doesn't the problem or not the problem but one of the things with this injection is what i've been reading it says it might you might not notice a, a difference from like for like two to three months and so you're never going to know if that's like the thing that it worked or not or whether it was the gym work i've been doing for two months because that's how long gym work takes to kick in so if i'm smashing the gym for two months and i start feeling better i'll probably give credit to that where it might be the prp as well who knows i don't know five days now i ran today did some gym doesn't feel great i just i'm just hoping it gets better that's that's what i'm hoping just gradually starts improving i got to actually wednesday i meet the surgeon so i go up to melbourne have appointment with um with the surgeon his name's julian Faller. he's one of the best oh, regarded yeah, knee, guy. yeah one of the best regarded knee surgeons in the country uh Does so we're just kind of, footballers is that where i've heard him from he, he would he he's pretty much the leader i believe in Jeez. orthopedic surgeon yeah so Would he's going to pull some strings to get in this guy pretty well um... no i just got it he just basically got an appointment come through a text message saying you booked in to see the surgeon on wednesday this julian fellow press yes to confirm and i was like okay yes but i reckon it's going to cost me a fortune just for a chat we will see hopefully mm. not he but. looks like a smart guy just looking at the photos of him yeah i had to read through like his resume and stuff um and he's done some shit. Mm. I like that. Okay. Good luck with that. Thanks. Oh, the same guy's written an article on him who did that uh, Stewie article, Conrad Marshall. Oh, yeah? Remember that big, yeah. Four, yeah, yeah, yeah. Four years ago, this guy has done a piece on him as well about how he saves people's sporting careers. So, Moose, yeah. how long will you give this, like, when would you make the call about surgery? Mm, yeah i don't know i'm gonna to have to talk to him i i don't know it's 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 the ideal time to get it to have surgery because of the baby coming the no races all that stuff however i've like there are there's horror stories of guys getting cartilage taken out and then being arthritic really soon down like in the future because they got no cartilage left so yeah, I'm going to ask him all these things, of course. Mm, good luck with that. I Thanks. kicked off my week uh, 50 minutes at 4.25 pace Monday morning, double in the afternoon, just did uh, 6K, 4.28 pace, nothing to really report there. Archie and I met up for a workout on Tuesday morning. We did um, five by four minutes at about three minute K pace with 90 seconds jogging between. And then we did four 30 seconds pretty hard at the end of that um, with 60 seconds jog between just to work on that kind of, yeah, faster pace, kind of averaging like 240 pace. Not sure how accurate that is in 30 seconds, but a good little workout, 32 minutes. Um, yeah, working a couple of different systems there. So really enjoyed that one. Good to still be able to train with one other person and yeah, tick things off in the afternoon. Got out for 6.3K again at our... 427 pace on Wednesday did 90 minutes that was before you and I interviewed Sinead Bradley and I'm just looking at some of these comments here you were accusing me of being a bit of a name dropper because I said I was interviewing her later on in the afternoon there but that was good got out for that thought of some, some thought of some questions while I was jogging out there for 90 minutes um, afternoon jog of 8k at 422s 10k easy in the morning and in the afternoon on Thursday, that was a day at home with Hudson. Um, yeah, it was some good weather. I started to get some like 18, 19 degree days up here in Echuca, Moama. So enjoyed that in the afternoon. And then I did some surges Friday morning. Um, yeah, did 12K and then just did like six 20 second surges before work. I was one of those ones where I just, you know, when you sometimes do strides and you can't be bothered like changing your shoes over and taking like the extra two minutes that that takes. So I just did them during my run in the last uh, couple of Ks, which I can't hit the same pace I would usually when, I, when I've when i got the um, lighter shoes on, but it's a good way. I kind of, these are kind of like half ass strides, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say here. Got out for 10K in the afternoon, Friday night as well. And then Saturday was my workout of the week, kind of marathon specific one. I did a mile under marathon pace, so at about 310 kilometer pace, which is about five minutes for the mile. 
and then a mile kind of float at 325 k pace which i think was about 525 530 ish for the mile and did that seven times um archie did the first five with me but he was doing three minutes with me at 310 pace and then kind of kicking down the last two minutes and then i'd kind of catch him in the float so it was good to have company for the first yeah what was he he was there for like the first 16k um my session ended up being like 22.4k it was good heart rate data was good paces was good uh, a bit warmer again felt a bit warmer out there getting in the sun i think it was like 16 degrees by the time we finished um yeah seven that would have been seven weeks out from melbourne so a good little workout got that off clousy actually moose your mate you were just talking about before he kind of said mile on mile off yeah i asked him what are some of his good marathon um workouts he'd he suggested doing this like nine times doing it for like 28 or 30k but i don't want to molly molly seidel mentioned that in moose's interview as well did she uh, ali yeah. did this workout in the clousy probably gave it to all of them so Al, ali moose <laughs> clousy's pinched this and claimed it do, do cloudy, they, fart, cloudy fart like do they go all the way to 30k ali's was like 36 or something 36k a mile on like mile under mile over or did she do like a 10k warm-up beforehand no, I'm pretty sure it was like... No, you couldn't do that for 36K. It was a lot. Yeah, you can. I think it was... Tw- yeah, I'm pretty sure it was 10 of them. So 20 of them. 32K. Stop, yeah. Stop pulling him down, Moose. Here he is thinking he just banged out an awesome <laughs> session and you basically told him he's done the, the little boy session. Got to do another 10K <laughs> worth of it. Yeah. No, well, you're probably going faster than marathon pace. Yeah, I was. I was working on, I reckon I'm working on 3.17 for me marathon pace. So I went oh, seven God. seconds under, seven seconds over. You're faster than that, though. What, just what's, because 3.17 is like 2.18, isn't it? 2.17. That's like Croaks' pace. Yeah, but like everything you're doing lately is is f- like faster and um, yeah, well, I just... Well, if, I I, see... if I was certain I actually had a marathon coming up, I might be a bit more ambitious with the sessions and the speeds I'm going. But you're still training for a marathon. Yeah, the Mar- right? I'm a marathon. Yeah, going to do a time are you, trial. Are you really? I think I'm going to, oh. yeah. I like having purpose in my life, and I think if I have a time trial booked in, um, I think I, I think it could be something good and fun to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know about a I, marathon. If you, ask me, if you ask me 12 months ago, I'd be like, no, that's, that's a bit silly. You know like, why he wants to do it? Back. You know why he wants to do it, Moose? Because he, he knows that Echuca and Moama is quite friendly on the GPS. And oh, he no. can yeah. put, it, put it in his Instagram bio and <laughs> tell us he's the fastest marathon <laughs> PB on the, on the podcast. Do you, sure, reckon, do you reckon have a go at 214, Brad? That's a bit ambitious, I reckon. Well, why not? You, you do it at the industrial estate for sure. No, no, no. I'll do it on the same course that I did that half marathon on. Two turns yeah, two exactly. turns per 10K. Exactly. That was legit um, as that one last year, remember? Behind, behind, behind a bus. Yeah, I'll get the bus out. I'll get the trucks out. I'll get bikes out, drink stations. You don't have anything to lose if you're going to do it. I mean, if you exactly if, you if it's blow gone, up, I'll just pull. It. I'll just pull. If you run two thirteen, doesn't count. And if I'm not on yeah. two fourteen pace at thirty two k, I'll just walk off, or I'll just stay as long as I can at two fourteen pace, and then put on Strava that I could have held that till the end. <laughs> kind right? of like, I like it. It's not a bad idea. Well, well, I'm gonna like baby, same as you, Moose. Baby due in December, so you know I'm not going to be doing much in Jan, Feb, March, with with two kids and one one of those kids being a newborn. I'm fairly fit at the moment. I'm getting an iron infusion next Monday, Croak. So I'm doing all this training at the moment off a ferritin score at 35. Imagine what happens when they pump 35? out. 35? Like, yeah. That's that's within the range. That's not that bad. 35. Yeah, you have to be under 30 to get the iron infusion from the hospital, but they can do it a bit lower at this other clinic nearby. 35 <laughs> is pretty low. Yeah, not it's really. not that low. It doesn't, oh, shit. Yeah, 35 is pretty as low. Long as, you, as long as you're within the range, the number that doesn't necessarily matter. Yes, yeah. it shows that you've got enough. Distance distance runners shouldn't be at thirty five. Yeah, no, there's a different range for athletes. That's, surely, yeah. Don't don't you say fifty moose? Isn't that your made up yeah. range? Well, from what I've seen, like I've seen performance start dropping at thirty for sure. Mm. Probably probably over thirty is when I've like I've seen athletes start complaining about being tired and wondering what's wrong with them. Yeah. And and if you're doing that, then your performance is dropping. Yeah. 
So I'm doing this off performance dropping croaks. Imagine when I do a bit of <laughs> zero me, Blake. But, but your performance you, is not dropping. No, it's you're not, not exactly. You're not complaining about any fatigue and your sessions are good. So I think maybe I've just been tired I, I for so this, long. I think this normal, iron infusion is going to be placebo for you. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. Tell you what, I'm going to run fast once this iron infusion happens. So that's another with, reason to do it. I'm with, I'm with Brad on this. If you're not noticing it, then it's probably not a problem. Mm, yeah, we'll see. We go and get it. Go and get it if it makes you feel better. Make you feel better. Just know the numbers are right. Um, yeah, because usually I find I fade at the end of workouts. That's what I've noticed it in the past, but I haven't been doing that recently. But yeah, maybe, maybe you're pacing them better too. Yeah, getting it right. Someone's birds going off there. You know, no, the birds, it, birds are getting excited about the marathon Cedric, time trial. <laughs> Cedric's up and about. He found his squeaky toy. Oh, anyway. David. So that was a good workout. I like that. Thanks, Clousy, for sending that one through. Good work <laughs> inventing that workout. Uh, got 5K warm up and cool down done there as well. So that was like 32K morning, which I like doing these things on Saturday mornings because it keeps me off the beers Friday night, gives me something to do on a Saturday morning during lockdown. And it also, this was an interesting one because um, Archie had already finished and cooled down. So I was like 500 meters from my house. So I jogged to my house to get my headphones. And I was just like endorphins going off, kind of feeling pretty good about myself because I've done a workout, nice sunny day, thinking I'm going to do a marathon time trial in a couple of months. And then um, when I went home to get my headphones, Carly told me how regional Victoria had gone into lockdown, which like cooks us for school, like changed my job massively. And also that like New South Wales had like 850 cases. And I'm like, oh, I wish I didn't know that because it just impacts my mental health like so dramatically and so now i'm like stop and check and twitter and stop and check and news.com.au every morning and stuff like that just because i just want to live in my little world of running and inside running podcast and running well, pb and like parenting and just like i'm just blocking all that shit out now i'm not dealing with it anymore from here on in so good, yeah it's a good way to be they call it doomsday scrolling yeah i've actually made a folder on my phone with like um facebook instagram Oh, they're the only two in there because they're the only like doomsday things I got. And when I click on it, like I've got to click twice into it now if I want to go check Twitter and it just says doom scroll with a question mark. Like, is this what you're going to do, Brady? And then the whole day today, I haven't checked Twitter. So I'm pretty proud of myself. Ask me Twitter's how... been good today too. Twitter's been real good. <laughs> well, I don't even know. why I follow a whole lot of running things. I'm not sure why when now I scroll, I just see a whole lot of like COVID stuff. Algorithm. Like, I'm like, I didn't choose to follow any of you people. Why are you guys all tweeting about, other than that other than that lady that you told me to follow, your mate? But, yeah, I'm getting stuck. She's pretty upbeat, though. She's a good one to follow. No, she'll I, give you the... I don't even want to know the numbers anymore. I don't care. Oh, I do care. Sorry, I care. But I'm like, yeah, when you get negativity, like, so often, and, like, yeah, and, yeah, I don't know. It just wasn't. And then that stuff in Afghanistan last week. Like, do you guys watch that video of that plane trying to take off? I'm just like, yeah. fucking hell. Like, what? Yeah, and then that global warming report. I'm just like, I've got to stop checking stuff. I'm getting worked up now just talking about it. <sighs> yeah. Anyway. Breathe. Um, Breathe. I did four, yeah, I did 40 minutes on Sunday. as a nice recovery day. Beautiful weather, 21 Sunday. So i just been working in the garden. That was just true recovery. Did 153Ks for the week. Seven weeks to marathon, possibly Melbourne. Possibly not. Possibly Moama. Doing a 10K time trial in three weeks, though, boys. We're got, at? Uh, we're doing Moama, the point-to-point point one. You know, the half of the half marathon course that we did last year. Me, Paddy Stowe, Archie Reid. Downhill? Uh, no, nah, there's no hills here. Can't go downhill. Can't go downhill or uphill. Um, two losers have to buy the other one a slab. Go halves. So we want to make sure that Archie doesn't win because he drinks Canadian Club. Could be an expensive day for Canadian Paddy Stowe and I. Yeah. Fucking bogan. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we just got to try to try to beat him and we'll be right. Paddy Stowe won't be able to afford a, a half a slab. I think he's got a bit of money, Paddy Stowe. Kid from Albury, the king from Albury. Doesn't spend it his, on football. Yeah, doesn't he? Uh, he wears them till they're dead. Sent me a photo of his the other day. He's like, these have a thousand on them. They were cooked. What were they? What kind? The Sockany Endorphins. Yeah, he reckons he only races in um, Next Percent, so he only puts them on for races. So I'll see if he rocks up this time trial in them. They must be pretty fresh. Anyway, that was my week. I want to thank some Patreon supporters. Kick us off, Croaks. All right, I've got Ryan Carley this week. Uh, Ryan lives in East London, UK. 
runs 17.48 for 5K, 82 for the half, and he's maybe running the London Marathon for the Lighthouse Construction Charity. Uh, he's got a pretty locked down Strava and Instagram account, uh, so probably he's got a really important job then. That's a uh, good assumption, Brady. It's the only reason you lock it down, folks. But uh, thanks for your support. <laughs> thanks for your support, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. What about yep. Ryan Carly? My wife's name's Carly, exactly the same spelling. My brother's name's Ryan. Shit. Combination of the two. Maybe, what, maybe, they've, gone, maybe they've gone halves in a Patreon subscription and they just changed the address. Oh, and that's why they're on private croaks. <laughs> Your brother listened to the podcast, nah. Brady? No, nah, he doesn't even know what it is. <laughs> you know, have you got any family members? They're like, yeah, you still doing that radio show? You ever see them at Christmas? He's like that. Uh, <laughs> just ask me why I run every time you, I see him. So, you know you can drive, it's cheaper. He's, <laughs> easier on the body, stuff like that. Yeah, those kind of gags. You've met my brother, Moose. I have, yeah. Remember he was talking about buying a lawnmower from Aldi that uh, day? That he's kind of, a much, that much kind better of guy. bloke than you. Oh, uh, yeah, everyone tells Higher me Higher quality individual, would have a beer with him 10 times before I had a beer. Yeah, right <laughs> remember he thought Bree was Ali and Ali was Bree? Uh, I can't... <laughs> Uh, no, I don't remember. He met Bree the night before, and then the next day, I think, like, Ali opened the door, and he, he thought that was Bree. He's like, oh, oh. Yeah. how'd your race go? And Ali's like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I do now. I do. That was good. Who are you thinking? It happens quite often, actually. Uh, Elliot Nolan. He's from Birch Grove in New South Wales, the COVID land, land of COVID. 2140, no, 21.26 for 5K. 44.46 for 10, 142 at the Canberra Half Marathon 2021. Uh, good work getting to that race. That race is now seeming like one of the only ones that goes ahead, isn't it, for uh, for 2021, Canberra? And they Hobart. did real well. And Hobart, post, the postponed Hobart, d- is doing real well. Uh, won the 2019 Most Improved Male um, at the at Woodstock Runners in Sydney. So there you go, Woodstock Runners. Where are they at? Yeah, I hadn't heard of the Woodstock Runners before. Must be some kind of group in Sydney. Anyway, they're dishing out uh, trophies for him. Most Improved 2019. We love that. We love Most Improved. Yeah, it means you're training well consistently and then you're getting the improvements out. Well done, Elliot. Thanks to Patrick Hilly from uh, Melbourne. He's the guy I'm taking this week. 16.37 for 5K, 39.57 for 10. He ran a 1.16 uh, half marathon time trial around Albert Park after Gold Coast Marathon got cancelled this uh, year, not so long ago. And he ran 3.18 at the Melbourne Marathon in 2019. So that time is well under threat when he uh, gets into a marathon, gets onto a start line. Uh, puts a lot of photos up of music on his Strava. Been listening to a bit of Stormzy, Harry Styles, Calvin Harris, and Hot Chip all making a bit of an appearance in there. What's Hot Chip? Hot Chip. Haven't heard of the band Hot Chip. I've heard of it, but I don't know what it is. Triple J band. Kind of, um, I'd compare them to Glass Animals a bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they're good. They're good, aren't they? Yep. They do that Tokyo Drift. Tokyo Drift. You know, with, um, fuck, Denzel Curry. Oh, do they? Oh, it's good. One of my favourite songs. One of my favourite songs of all time, Tokyo Drift. Get on it. Oh, I haven't heard that one. I've been listening to less and less radio. Like, once you get Spotify going and then, like, once the album... It's not on the radio. Where where do you hear these songs? Like, Nipsey, who you were talking about the other week. Where do they come into your life from? You just go down rabbit holes, I guess, of, like, people that are like other people on... um, on Spotify, but I, I mean Nipsey Hussle. Don't you remember when he died? All the like celebrities were putting up tribute posts and stuff. You, you obviously don't. But um, Denzel Curry's pretty popular. He did Raging Bulls. Yeah, like, I know Rag- Denzel Curry. Yeah, he you did. Do. The, he Bulls did the like, like a version. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so, but this is a popular song. Yeah. This was a re- really popular song. Have to listen to it. Hey, uh, have you got an apology plan for my Patreon comments last week as well? Absolutely that, not. That, I d- that I black and white don't. dog was a Kelpie. I had so it correct. it's not a Kelpie. It was a Kelpie. It's not she a wrote Kelpie. in. Holy you dog. Write, you read the message. I don't have it here. I was just waiting for your apology. So it was, 
it's black and white, which means it's not a Kelpie. Well, was it, was it some kind of Kelpie? Just a yes, may, or, yes or no answer. It may have some Kelpie in it. That doesn't mean it's a Kelpie. Anyway, it was a Kelpie, she reckons. She's the owner of the dog. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for Kelpie. writing in, Flirt. She uh, didn't say it's a Kelpie. Croak's good, just, good week <laughs> to be a Patreon supporter, isn't it? Yeah, we um, we had a big week actually in terms of, and that was one of the positives of, of lockdown was that we had a lot more free time. So we managed to, um, yeah, interview Sinead, Pat Tin and, and Jed, Jen Gregson all in the space of, what, four days. So um, we're pretty lucky and so they're all up on Patreon at the moment. Yeah, so if you sign up to Patreon at that level, you get the uh, you get an RSS feed that sometimes if you follow us on social media, you'll see like the, the yellow Patreon kind of image. And then that's where all these episodes sit. So they'll be all coming out on like future episodes, but you can get them right now if you want to support us on Patreon as a bit of a way of thanks. Plus, there's like all the Road to Nowhere stuff, Road to Valencia, Road to New York, Friends of the Show episodes that we've done. Um, I think we worked out over 100 episodes. So, um, yeah, if you want some runner material and you want to support the Inside Runner podcast and help us come out every single week, patreon.com slash inside running podcast is where you can find us. Some news, fellas. Prefontaine Classic. You watch it? Get up Sunday morning? Taped it and then watched it when I got up. It wasn't that late, was it? Wasn't it like 7 no. a.m.? No, no, so I watched part of it and then I – because I just recorded it. So I actually – you know what? I find recording the Diamond Leagues and fast-forwarding it is so much better in terms of use of time because there's so much stuff there that I don't want to watch. Like when they cut away to somebody doing the pole vault, you know, you just basically fast forward it. So I can watch a two hour Diamond League in half an hour. It's awesome. But yes, I did. So I did watch the uh, races. Cool. I reckon if you got into some of that, you would enjoy it. I have the the, the jumping in the throw. Yeah, but they don't, it's not, I don't reckon it's quite as thorough as the Olympic coverage of the jumps, though. It's a real sort of just, oh, yeah, this person's, you know, they don't show as much of it, I don't reckon. But um, I'm happy to watch all the running races, but a lot of the, the field events the diamond leagues I'd, I'd prefer just to fast forward and get to the running races do you want to start with the men's 1500 because we had three aussies in there not the same three from uh the olympics but two of the three stewie was there uh ollie hall was there and matthew ramson was there fascinating race stewie took him a while to get going again boys did you watch Standard. that off the line yeah. yeah i actually thought um you know he, like his start was terrible as always but he didn't accelerate straight away. He sort of sat back a little bit, and I thought, oh, Stewie's going to try something different here. And then, like, nah, straight to the front. Well, and, Tim Chariot um, did, didn't he? Like, he kind of tried something different. Yeah, yeah. But um, it was a bizarre race in that I couldn't believe how much Stewie and Inga Britson had just gapped the field by. Um, you know, it was almost like there was two races going on. And, uh, yeah, Inga Britson was too strong in the end, so he won in – uh, let me just find the time, 347.24. So that's like a world lead, national record, diamond league record, and a PB. Stewie was second in 348.4, which is um, just outside his Aussie record. And Tim Chariot was third in 351.17. So, um, yeah, like, what do you reckon is going through Stewie's head? Like, I have no doubt that if Stewie could, Stewie could have produced something like that uh, at the Olympics, then he definitely would have finished higher than he did. Because, you know, like the way that he towed up some of those, the guys that were in the second pack, it was it was impressive to watch. Yeah, it was such a big gap, as you said. Like, it just grew and grew. And it was at that stage where I could start yelling at the TV because I knew they weren't going to catch him. And I'm like, come on, Stewie, can we kind of hold off Inga Britson here and possibly kind of win it? But um, when Inga Britson goes wide and passes... Like, can anyone catch him, boys? I don't think so. Not now. No. His highs are tied after the after the gold medal and stuff as well. And how much, is it, how much would he be loving it as well, just going, oh, yep, here's Stewie to be my pacemaker. And then, yep, 150, 200 to go. Thanks, Stewie. Well, he does have to run these, though, meet records and, you know, Diamond League yeah. records and world leads to, to, to beat Stewie kind of thing, though. So that's one good thing. And, that's, and I think that's what makes Stewie's run so impressive is that he's largely doing this as a time trial. Well, they yeah. did have a doing pace so much for, work. Wait, how long was the yeah. pace there? Two laps? No, yeah, yeah, two and a yeah. bit. And then he nearly got in Stewie's road. He was kind of losing time and Stewie nearly took him out. Did you see that coming around with 700 to go? 
I'd love to know what Stewie's, you know, like to, to back up from the Olympics and have this sort of run, like how he feels about his Olympic run, which um, at some point I'm sure we'll get him on and have a chat to him about it. Cause I'm, I'm sure he'd be disappointed with the Olympics, like considering everything else he's done this season. I, I, yeah, can, I, I, can't, I can't help thinking about the 350 mile he ran in Penguin. Like I know I bring this up a lot, but consider that run, right? You put him running that time trial down at a local track on a Saturday Arvo with no with a crowd of what two hundred people or so, and then like you you insert that run into the race we just saw the Diamond League at the pre classic marquee event the mile, and with all these Olympians, Olympic silver medalists, and all of a sudden he's still coming third basically in that run from a time trial down in Penguin. Like yeah. it's just, it's that run is going to be one of the most underrated, undervalued runs of all time, I reckon, because I can't get over that. And that would be from his run there, half a second per lap that he's gained having a, like the debuting at Hayward Field, new stadium, um, having a pacemaker in front of him, having Inga Britson on his ass, having a crowd in front of you. Like this is, this is exceptional. It was exceptional what he did, Danny Penguin. Mm, yeah, good comparison. Oliver Hall was fifth in 351.63, a PB for him over the mile. And Matthew Ramsden was 11th in 353.97. So uh, good to see three Aussies in a pretty deep field like that, fellas, because they did have the, um, I think they call it the international mile, but pretty much like the B-grade mile the day before. So it was good to see all the Aussie guys in this one. Mm. Uh, women's 1500 was on as well we got to see Lyndon Hall and Jessica Hull go around again and this was deep as well you had the silver and the gold medal from the Olympic final in there Faith Kip Yagon and Laura Muir um, Kip Yagon's bloody impressive isn't she fellas the way she kind of went and she we're talking about people time trialing she was by herself for a whole lot of that race yeah different league um, yeah, like what she win by six well, over six seconds. Yeah, six and a half seconds she won by. Um, but credit to Linda, you know she finished best of the rest uh, in second place, three fifty nine seven three. So um, you know beat the Olympic silver medalist. Um, and then Josette Norris was third in four minutes point zero seven. Um, our other Aussie Jess Hull, uh, not a great day for Jess, eleventh in four oh five point three three. She was there though, wasn't she? She put herself in a good position again. But um, yeah. do you think it's like si- you look at Muir though as well though? Like are people just getting tired? Long seasons, yeah. a lot of stress with traveling and stuff. Like we're seeing a bit of a range now of what people are putting out. Yeah, and it's always been the way. After like a major championships, um, particularly Olympics, people either go to maybe a new level if they're sort of on the up going into the Olympics, or you know they've put everything physically and emotionally into the Olympics and. They're sort of just hanging on for a little bit too long. So I guess it depends sort of where you're at. And, you know, like I'd imagine it'd be hard to for some people to get up. Like if you've won, like Mule, for example, like you've come second at the Olympics, you know, you put probably so much pressure on yourself. Like you're going to have this down period, I reckon. Like so it's, yeah, I guess it all comes down to the, the individual athletes and what their goals are and how, how driven they are for the rest of the season. A lot of the big Nike athletes have the pre-classic written into their contract as well. And having a meet written into your contract means that you have to run it uh, to satisfy the requirements of the of, of the relationship. So a lot of these people will be here without really wanting to be here. It won't match their season. And they probably ended their season at in, oh, in Tokyo. But they've just got to tack this one on at the end. So the motivation's a little lower there. They sort of already finished their season mentally and physically as well, so they just go around, get around in a in a moderate time and collect their <laughs> collect their contract or, or tick that box. Is that why Kip Chogi was there in the crowds and stuff? He would be there exactly for that. And same same pr- reason why Chariot probably saw the pace go out and go fuck that. I'm not interested. I'm here for a tick in a box. Yeah, must be like um because like especially with Kip Chogi, like he goes away to his camp away from his like you know, wife and kids and stuff, and then he goes and wins a gold, and then he's still got to stay away from home to go do these kind of things. I'm sure it's financially rewarding, very much so, but they've been away for a while, some of these guys, if you think about their prep into Tokyo, and now they're still doing this after Tokyo. 
Anyway. Yeah, I guess it's their job though. And yeah, I mean, the very best in the world, they don't, like the greats, they they tend not to balance their life too well. Yeah. If that makes sense, it's more about 100% goes into their career and their dedication to their craft. Like, yeah, they might not see their family. I, I, I actually don't think that would probably be a big priority for a lot of them. Um, not, I'm not saying that these runners are, are thinking like that. I'm just saying, like, you look at the very, very best. They're very one track minded to greatness rather than trying to balance, like you said, family life and all that. Mm-hmm. Safan Hassan had to go at the world record in the 5K but missed it. She ran 14.27, missed it by a bit there. Um, I think you watched that, Croak. She went out pretty hard then faded. Oh, I just was getting uh, live split. That's right. So, this was on the yeah. Friday night, wasn't it? No footage. Yeah. So she was on 14.10 pace through 3K and then faded pretty bad. Yeah, so the last 2K – wasn't uh, wasn't very impressive at all, but um, I guess you had a crack, but wasn't to be. Chapter Guy won the men's two mile. This was a great race. Joshua Chapter Guy won in eight oh nine fifty five. Salomon Barrega, the Olympic ten thousand meter champ, he was second in eight oh nine. Don't see Barrega get beaten eight oh nine point eight. Don't see him get beaten in a kick finish that often. But Chapter Guy put him to the sword pretty well. Paul Chalimo, 809.83. So that was a cool finish. I did love Chapter Guy coming across the line, like beating at his um, chest. Hmm. He calls himself the Silverback or something, doesn't he? Yeah. I think that's his nickname. <laughs> I think what Chapter Guy did well was not really leave it to the straight. Like he sort of gapped, he gapped them. So so it almost took Brager's kick out, out of it. Um, yeah, so even so, it probably looks a bit closer on the times than it actually was. Like, because he did have a, he did have a decent gap there. Oh yeah, you know, he was easing up, straight. celebrating, and then yeah. ran in the back of him over the line. Did you see that? Yeah. So I don't know about you guys, but I I struggle to really get excited about two miles. This is like I guess because we just don't run them here, and um, like unless somebody like if somebody was going to break Coman's, I know Coman's two mile record is like unbelievable. So I'd probably be excited if I saw somebody break that record. But in terms of the two mile, it sort of doesn't mean a lot to me. I don't know about you, good boys. I'm just I just with... remember it. Uh, I just remember it from Motra. Oh, running. that's exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. I just want to know so, what time he ran when he was there. Eight oh three. Eight oh three. So six it, seconds ahead of Chapter Guy. Incredible, incredible run, and probably the hardest Australian record to break of all time. Yeah, that was two thousand and seven. That puts it in. That's I was just about to say, Croaks. That's the only thing I can can relate it to because I remember that as well. Yeah, and isn't the world record like seven fifty eight or something like that? Like two two sub four minute miles back to back. Like it's it's amazing. Well, it must be the closest an Australian's got to a distance running world yeah. record. Well, what do you mean? Like to be within five seconds of it. Well, well they, except for the ones that broke the world record. Well, Stewie. Stewie's within how many seconds oh, of yeah, the... Oh, yeah, 1,500. Uh... <laughs> yeah, well, it's a bit different over the shorter distance. Think about I mean, the difference currently. in... I mean, I mean I'm saying, yeah, look at the Australian record for 5K and the world record for 5K. Look at the 3K, 3K, 10K, 10K, half marathon, half marathon, marathon, marathon. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the um, you're right, that the two miles probably the closest. What's the world 3K record? Oh, it's is 8.20... 720. 20, yeah. Coman as well, right? Okay, so Stewie might be close to within, yeah, if it's 720. Yeah. Anyway, that was a good observation. Uh, there was the women's two mile as well. Francine Neo Bassa, she won it. She took down uh, G'day. G'day was second. Nine minutes to 906 to Helen Obiri from Kenya in third, 914. This is the athlete, guys, that um, has, I don't think, you wouldn't call them dreadlocks, maybe the braids. The Bourne Braids, we saw her at the, um, I think it was the 5K. Know the yeah, athlete I'm talking she, about? Yeah, I think she so, ran, and she ran the 10 as well, but she ran the last, I think she finished second at the last Olympics in the 800, um, yeah. but wasn't able to compete in the 800 due to the, those new testosterone rules. Yep. Um, so had to move up in distance. She was DQ'd in the 5 at the Olympics too, I believe. That's right. Yep. And I think she and, was pretty like protesting against her federation not appealing it. Mm, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, and she ran quite well in the ten. She finished in the top few, um, I think under thirty-one. 
no, units for that. No to yeah. watch there. Let's go domestically. Hey, Moose, tell us about the Adelaide Marathon. Yeah, well, that got up, so that was nice. Probably only – there's no one from New South Wales or Victoria there. Not sure about Queensland, um, but it would have been – like we had a few athletes training for it so shame we couldn't have sent over a contingency from victoria went out pretty was pretty fast actually so the jacob cox won it in the mail in 222 um and tara palm was the ladies winner 251 uh say it's more of a tempo for tara so that's pretty pretty good marathoning there for a, it's a pretty hilly course, a lot of curves in it, I think. So not ideal for a fast race. Uh, Jacob's debut marathon, I believe. Um, Tara's run marathons before, hasn't she? No, nah, debut as well, I think. Oh, really? Did okay. See that well, photo of her foot? Yeah. She's got a so real she, bad blister. She did it in heavy shoes as well. She wasn't in a racing shoe. That's what made me think it was more like a tempo. And given her 10K and her running pedigree, 251 wouldn't be yeah. that satisfying for Tara, I don't she think. But she's had that. some injuries. Yeah, she had some injuries. Um, half marathon, Bryn Nichols, 69.55. Belinda Richardson, 122.03. And in the 10K, Isaac Hayne, 29.53. Caitlin Adams, 33.01. So the run of the day there, I'd say Caitlin Adams, 33.01. Perhaps Jacob, 222. I don't know. Mm. Good to see one get get underway and get finished, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a bit of a weird feeling for the rest of us. Well, Perth's got one coming up in about, oh, I'm going to say eight weeks, nine weeks, two weeks after Melbourne it's meant to be, I think. So they might get a go over there in the west. Yeah. Can't and then the sunny, pop it up. sunny Coast will go. That's the same day as Melbourne. So hopefully they stay safe up there and they only get, and they'll probably just get Queensland people, maybe Western Australians and South Australians, Anyone from, not from ACT, New South Wales or Victoria. But, yeah, Sunny Coast is probably the, the safest next one as well, isn't it? Do you reckon Athletics Australia put one on in the new year? Oh, I would, I mean, it's, I would love it because I think we're going to need one because really there's nothing fast in Australia now after Melbourne until, what, like Hobart's not fast enough, I don't think. We've sort of seen that. It gets windy there. Uh, Can- Canberra's at altitude and not that fast. Canberra's not that fast. Like there needs to be some, there needs to be a fast run in the Australian late summer or early autumn. Yeah, I agree. Give people opportunity to hit some times to uh, do the world champs and yep. the com games. See what happens there. Uh, Kenanisa Bikili, he's put his name down to run at not only Berlin Marathon, but also New York City Marathon. That's kind of good this time of the year, seeing all these names pop up for the elite marathon season. It's, it's pretty packed because a few races have had to move from April, March to uh, September, October, November. So he'll have 42 days between the two races, fellas. Um, be the first time since 2004 that he will not be introduced on the start line as the world record holder in the 5K and the 10,000 metres. He was quoted to saying, I still feel that I am the best and better than anyone, Bikili <laughs> said in an interview last week, last Tuesday Love morning. That. How I th- good's that? I think every athlete and others should think like that. So, yeah. Jeez. This guy sounds like this guy sounds like Moose when he's um, when he's him. injured and when he's not doing real well. <laughs> hey guys, I'm still the best. <laughs> Love Bikili. Channel your Bikili. Everybody should channel their Bikili. Just get up and about. Just start throwing out banter like that. Like keep Shogi sitting at home going, "What? Kenny says he's the best." <laughs> well, After what Moose, I've done. Thoughts thoughts on him being entered in both of these 42 days apart? Do you? <laughs> Do you think that he's going to end up in the gutter on one of these races? Yeah, or both. No, I'm going to back him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he, his very his hard oh. strike rate at marathons is so low. Isn't it? A, isn't it a shame though that like his legacy, you know, for what he's done on the track, he's now just becoming sort of remembered for the guy that doesn't finish marathons, yeah. or you know, you see you see in the gutter, which is which is a shame. Um, yeah. Compare that to Haile Gebra Slassie, right? Yeah. He he sort of went out like he didn't. Once he had a, a bad one or or maybe two, he was gone, done. Like he doesn't need it. Obviously, Bakili's sort of 
he's either a got nothing going on at home and he like he doesn't have businesses and stuff like maybe some other retired runners or he actually does believe that he can go out there and pull it off and it's only two years since he ran that 201 but he's not going to pull he's not going to pull both of these off like he's not going to run well at both of these so no but he's going to get paid for both of these yeah but but then it's always the at what point do the the meet organizers sort of see through it and go oh yeah okay he's a big name but We've seen him in the gutter at this marathon, this marathon, this marathon. Let's let's throw money somewhere else. Well, but that's be... why he's not doing yeah. London because he didn't. He would have. Remember last year when it was meant to be him versus Kip Chogi, and he pulled out two days before. Do you reckon he's got a tick next to his name there? They're not. They're not having him back. I wonder if I wonder if potentially he's using Berlin as a as a session um, before New York, <laughs> like you know, or using just or just having a, a bit of an insurance plan that you know. If Berlin doesn't go well, he'll pull the pin there and then have a crack at at, um, at New York. Gonna Guess be, time will tell. Going to be fascinating to watch. This episode of the Inside Running Podcast is sponsored by New Balance, helping athletes find their better. The New Balance Vongo Version 5 is the brand's latest running innovation within the Fresh Foam X collection, combining plush comfort with premium stability. With a breathable hypo-knit upper, precision-engineered fresh foam midsole, and medial post, the Vongo version 5 delivers an ultra-cushioned, lightweight ride with the stability in every stride. Deep flex grooves and a more robust underfoot experience help keep the foot moving efficiently. Um, that's all I've got for news this week, fellas. Listen to question croaks. They're both kind of around the same topic this one, so I put two in for you. You want to have a go at yes. summarising them both together? Mm, yeah, they're sort of Up slightly different. Well, the, So the first one comes in from Simon, and it's, Basically, um, the benefits of doing the session in the morning and an easy run in the afternoon versus doing it the other way around. So would be interesting to hear your thoughts in relation to session quality, the feel, heart rate, sleep quality, recovery, sore knee and tight hips in the morning and other physiological pros and cons. So, um, yeah, so basically what would you prefer to do you know, in terms of would you prefer to do the session in the morning, easy run in the afternoon or the other way around? Oh. So that's the first one. That's the, that's the first question. And the second one was in regards to um, if you want to add doubles to your program, what day of the week would you do it? Would you do it on your hard days or on your recovery days? And that one comes in from um, August Stephenson. And he wrote here that you're my favourite podcast, and that says a lot given that I'm a fan. That given I'm from Norway and still follow Jared Clifford on Strava, so they're the two questions sort of moulded together. It's funny where Christian's podcast. He's our favourite still. Where his favourite? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Christian. Uh, he's moving to Ballarat soon. You reckon, say, Christian, coming over. Need to open the border, Scomo. Let him in. <laughs> Um, okay. So, well, we'll do the first one first, eh? What would you right. prefer, boys? A session in the morning, an easy run in the afternoon, or the other way around? This really what? depends on your life, yeah, and how it old does. you are and how, like, all the examples are used. My So my personal preference, other than the fact that if I have nothing on all day, like sitting around for the session in the afternoon sucks, but in terms of the quality, I have no doubt that the quality of my session is better in the afternoon than it is in the morning. Um, and I generally feel like I move a lot better than I do in the morning. Um, but the downside of the afternoon sessions, especially in summer when it's hot and if it's a if it's a hard session, I definitely struggle to sleep that night. Um, so that's one of the downsides. But in terms of how I feel running, afternoon session for me. Yeah, me too. I, my heart rate's lower in the afternoon, without a doubt, than in the morning. So my sessions tend to go better, especially if they're heart rate based. And and I do feel better. Like I feel like during the day that I I develop a little bit more movement through my muscles and my joints. Like I feel more flexible, um, or whatever it is that old people warm up during the day. I don't know. Definitely, when I'm older, I'm fe- feeling like the afternoon runs are easier. But this it also works into extra recovery so on a tuesday like he's mentioned um oh no so he didn't mention that but say it's a tuesday doing it in the morning means that you're only 48 hours after your long run 
Whereas if you do the session in the afternoon, you give yourself an extra sort of 10 hours to recover. And that can make a difference between how you feel as well. Um, but this is more a life decision. If you're a professional runner, they can, like, they'll do it at, say, 9.30 after they get up and they have a few hours to get moving because um, they can. And I think that's sort of the more popular way to do it is, is the mornings. Like you said, Brad, it doesn't, it's not real fun to sit around all day yeah. knowing that it's, it's easier to eat a bigger meal after your workout and get back in that sort of, like, recovery routine throughout the day. And it can start affecting your sleep if you do a hard workout towards the end of the day. I know, like, um, I'll struggle to sleep uh, and my, my sleep quality will be less if if I'm doing a workout in the Arvo versus the morning. Yeah, lifestyle reasons I do all my workouts, or pretty much, yeah, 95% of them in the mornings, just because it's easy to get them in before work because I don't start till 9, I've got a bit of time there. Um, and then, yeah, I tend to look after Hudson after school most days, so it's easier then to bring him back home and um, go for an easy 30 minutes instead of trying to go for something that's going to maybe take me 70 or 80 or 90 minutes. But I do think, yeah, sometimes um, hitting certain speeds in the morning is difficult. Like I think doing threshold stuff and kind of like tempo stuff's stuff is a lot easier to get done. And like we rarely do super fast stuff because obviously we don't have a track here. Um, if I ever do uh, PM stuff, it's in the afternoon, so we can drive over to Shepparton and get on the track to hit those kind of paces. Um, but sometimes, like tomorrow morning, like when my alarm goes off at five thirty, it's like, oh, how am I going to get going at six thirty? Like you're never, you're never sure if your body's going to be fully awake by that. But I hit the massage gun, like you're being up for an hour, have a coffee, have the breakfast. It's amazing how like good you do feel. Like when our sessions start, like we warm up for. 25, 30 minutes, do the drills and stuff. And yeah, it's amazing how well you do cover the ground at such a early time. And I guess you're just used to it. So um, Yeah, you get yeah. used to everything, don't you? It's part of your routine and it becomes routine, automatic. And I love going to work on a Tuesday knowing like I've banged my session for the morning. Yeah. I can relax the whole day. I've just got to get out for half an hour when I get home from like, yeah, work. And um, yeah, it's a good way to kind of, yeah. But then... I say that, it's like, oh, I'd never have the energy to do a workout on a Tuesday afternoon, but I associate Tuesday afternoon from being tired because I've done a morning workout, so I'm not sure how I'd feel. Um, uh, the, one, def- Sorry, go on. the one thing I do like about the morning sessions, as you said, Brady, is it's like it's done, and if, if I do a double on a session day, that feeling of going out for an afternoon 30 minutes like after massage. the session – is so nice yeah. whereas if you, if you do it the other way around and you do the 30 minutes in the morning you're like oh man i've run already once today and i've still got to do this session this afternoon so psychologically i much prefer getting it done and then just going oh yeah i've just got to go out for an easy 30 minutes this afternoon um but in terms of doing the session in the morning i don't particularly like it another good thing with the morning ones is uh, you kind of have the brakes on early on because you can't go like that fast. Like we often might take the first rep to kind of work into things. Whereas if we do afternoon sessions on the track, like so, so many times we overcook it with the first rep just because we're, um, I don't know, probably more. Well, you, you do. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Cause, Cause you just love hanging it. Yeah. You're just like, this is how we usually start workouts at this effort. And all of a sudden you're three seconds up on the first 400 meter rep or whatever it is. But yeah, it, it holds us back doing, doing workouts in the morning. But, yeah, it really so, depends so much on the person's lifestyle, how old they are, how long it takes them to get going. Like, I don't know if I'd have the same answer in five years when I'm getting close to Croker's age, seven uh, years, nine years, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the second second question, which is, like, if you were trying to increase volume and you are adding doubles, when would you do it during the week? Um, my preference would be to do it on your session days um, just to make then the recovery days – purely recovery um plus as brady as what you said like if you do a session in the morning going out for an easy 30 minutes in the afternoon can sometimes flush some of that crap in your legs from, from the session um so that would be my preference if i was adding volume and, and doing it through doubles i would add the double on the session day yeah the um the just something that is mentioned here august 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 that's someone that's his name august yeah, august stephenson remember when we thanked him for patreon sport because it was the same Aug- spelling as john stephenson his last name uh ah, augustus i'm just thinking augustus um so what i'm thinking is if he, he's mentioned here that 
uh, where is it? I've been ending up feeling a bit stiff after the double days. It probably means that you're like, it's too much stress that double for you at the moment, because the idea of a double, the second run should not be to add all this stress where you start pulling up sore from. It should be that you're helping recover. Like um, Brad said, with getting rid of the shit out of your legs, getting some circulation going, clearing some lactate from the, from the either the, the morning's workout or the day before's workout. So, um, I don't just add that that is when that is when junk comes into it when you're doing a run but you're not hitting the purpose of the run that's the term of like that's the definition of junk mileage for me uh if you if say you you're sort of a little bit tired you beat up and you add a double just for the sake without really wondering why and you're running it a little fast and it's sort of contributing more to a regression in your development more than a progression so that's maybe you're running it a little fast maybe you're running it a little hilly or maybe it's just not required at that time but i I agree with brad i would like to keep doubles on the hard days um so if you keep your hard days hard and your easy days really easy that means that you can recover properly on uh, the day after you run hard for a workout and then you add the double in so that's that's how I look at it. It's the same sort of concept behind doing a harder gym workout on your after your session is because it means you've got a longer or an, and a more quality recovery period afterwards before your next hard day. Yeah, I'd yeah. agree with everything you talking And I think what I think what you're also getting at there, Moose, is with the whole adding doubles and increasing the mileage. Like you've got to ask yourself, like, yeah, why are you adding more mileage? Like, have you, have you hit your ceiling in terms? of improvement because he says here that he runs 100k a week and he wants to run 120 like you could potentially still keep improving off 100k a week it's you know you probably only need to start increasing mileage when you start to plateau um so you know the fact that if you're saying you're stiff and sore after doing doubles then maybe 100k is is enough yeah that's going to start affecting your workouts uh your performance will drop that kind of thing more risk of injury because more is not always better yeah, or add Ks in other ways. Like, can you add four or three K to your medium long run and not do that double the day before? Something like that. It's hard to know without seeing this program. Uh, Moose on the loose purchase of the week. Um, well, I don't have it. Oh, Moose on the loose. Gee, I've been, I've been a bit testy lately. What have I been testy about? Have I argued with you guys about anything? Hey, you've been pretty no, good. I was just going to say, Moose, that we um. I don't know, like, you, we agree with each other a bit more than we used to back in episode 50. Something's, something's off there. Because a few times you're like, oh, yeah, I agree with Brad. I'm like, oh. Even yesterday first. when he said, he's like, oh, I'll do an interview, boys. I'll interview Genevieve Lucas for you. And I was like, shit, you yeah. fell off my seat. Who's doing a bit of work? <laughs> hey, hey. No, no, no. I'm the man behind Shoe Geeks, the most popular yeah. spin on the spin-off on this podcast so don't we, we, we don't have too many spin-offs <laughs> the only <laughs> spin-off that gets released to the public um oh gee yeah what's yeah, been no. annoying you though uh oh i mean there's there's things that have been annoying me that i'm probably not going to talk about on the podcast um no i don't really okay. I, tell us off here yeah, oh, no, no. Week, Actually, I've got a question on purchase of the loose. I noticed today on Facebook that you're looking to buy a, a, a lactate, a blood lactate tester. Um, yeah, yep. Talk us, talk us through this. Have you, have you been inspired by the Ingebrigtsens? Well, not at all, really. It's just we prescribe, like as a coach, we prescribe threshold workouts and easy days and – I would like, so I, I want to progress my knowledge and experience as a coach, especially given that my athletic career is going downhill <laughs> and the transition to coaching is becoming a more real reality. And so I want to become more knowledgeable and I want to know uh, like little intricacies a little bit more in depth. And I, this is just something that I wanted to experiment with and play with because I think it will help a general overall coaching knowledge and 
I, I want to use it on some people myself just to get a bit of a gauge as to whether prescribing um, heart rate for easy days at like the aerobic threshold is is going to be easy to do using heart rate and, and after they undergo like a lactate profile test and and then finding a, a like a more specific threshold zone for heart rate work like that I think that's it like I wouldn't change how I was how I program an athlete but I would just be a little bit more accurate in my prescriptions around the workouts and the easy days I think so I, like I see benefit in it and they're the only two things I would use it for like I know some people use it during training where they do a, an interval and they take a, a lactate test and and they say oh no you're working too hard slow it down or whatever like that's definitely not what I'm about but yeah it's more about training prescription rather than training monitoring I think it's also good to because you know we use this threshold like real loose in terms of it's roughly this effort or you know this pace potentially if it's you know in a controllable environment but you can sometimes get away from that whereas if you did a couple of sessions where you got to that four millimole or whatever and you're like oh okay so that's so it almost reminds you exactly how it should feel whereas sometimes yeah. you can get a, you can get away from that feel in training you're like oh no i'm in that zone but then you're actually not whereas if you test it every now and then you go okay this is i'm i'm, I'm running too hard or i'm not running hard enough as a as a yeah ex as a coach as well who's not in person with some of your athletes you don't really know what that threshold is looking like and everybody has different heart rates so for me to look at someone and go oh yeah you ran 182 that's too high well it's not it might not be too high for them so you you you're guessing to a degree without actually seeing the athlete run the workout the data that you're seeing is only relative to that individual and you don't really know that without a sort of without some more conclusive testing as to sort of how that heart rate sits so um like obviously pace is one small indicator and you can run a threshold at 10k pace like you've suggested i have brad <laughs> but it doesn't mean that it's an actual threshold so yeah just it's i think it would just be you would just be more confident i think in your in your coaching to say hey this is the heart rate you need to be at for this workout yeah so where do you bloody get what are they're bloody expensive what's, they what's, are they are well, it's not even so much the unit like the units are probably 300 bucks but no like they're the not they're, they're more the good ones are more like yeah. 750 and even the strips you're looking at what two three bucks each time you do one more yeah so 25 strips for the one that i'm looking at it's like 140 bucks for the, yeah. the pack for 25 and and you use like four or five for a, a test yeah, like a step test. Yeah, step test. Yeah. So it's expensive. Um, which did anyone reply to you saying they got one for sale? Oh, just clowns, just clowns like Tony Lockyer <laughs> telling me that he's got plenty, but he won't sell it. <laughs> he doesn't even know what the thing is. Uh, so I'm going to delete that post because that's just embarrassing <laughs> right now. Um, and I'm just going to well, I'm just Ali. So we're going to get one for the business, but Ali. She's just working out whether she sees value in it, so whether she lets me get it or not. If not, then I'll buy it and I'll just use it for myself. My whole day was just at work and I just get a notification saying Brad Croker has tagged you in a post on Facebook. And I'm like, beautiful. This would be something good. That's exactly what it was. Anyway. Oh, I, uh, thought my comment, I thought my comment about getting uh, Christian to infiltrate, infiltrate Team Ingebrigtsen instead of dealing with Canova was the good one, where he could get in there and, knock off a couple of those lactate pros yeah i didn't know they were that expensive surely yeah. someone works at a uni where you can just pinch one and send it to me <laughs> i would definitely be pinching these things if i worked at a uni <laughs> the even anyway what's going up croaks what are you doing between now and next week um yeah not much another week of four well, we've got another what 10 10 days 11 days of lockdown um but yeah just another week of jogging um, will you guys yeah, think... get out of lockdown uh, I don't know. Like our cases are sitting at around 16, or between 16 and 20 each day. So while ever it stays at that, we won't get out of lockdown. Um, but really, while ever stuff's happening up in Sydney, we're, you know, we're so close to Sydney that we're in trouble anyway. Um, but, yeah, I think we might be doing a bonus show Wednesday, Brady. Yeah, yeah. That's the yeah, good thing about being locked down. We can do plenty of Patreon bonus shows. Yeah, We might try and get someone on the phone like we did with Sinead last week or we'll, um, do some listener questions or something. Mm. Yeah, we're pretty lucky. We're pretty lucky to be able to interview 
some of these athletes. Like, sort of pinch yourself sometimes, just, you know, realising how a lucky spell. you are. Brad was, Brad was pretty Oops. bloody good. Did you listen to those two he did? Who's? He should be a journalist. I, 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 reckon we, I reckon we just make, like, a fake, like, LinkedIn account or something for you, Crokes. The guy needs a job, surely. You can't be a fucking temporary teacher your whole life. <laughs> well, believe it or Sports not, I've said, this, I've said this to you boys, but I like I get pretty nervous before them. Um, and so, like, I, I make sure that I, I don't know, like, I prepare really thoroughly because I think the more prepared I am for it, the less nervous I am. Um, but, like, if you told me, what, when I started running, that I'd be in a position to sit, sit down with Olympians and Australian record holders and be able to chat to them one-on-one for 90 minutes, like... There's no way I would have believed it. So I definitely feel very privileged to be able to do it. So, um, yeah. And like, and while you're doing it, you never know how it's whether it's any good or not. So thanks for those people that wrote in. Um, well, I didn't re- – yeah, the feedback we got for the Sinead one was really heartwarming. Because mm, yep. you get off and me- remember you messaged me like, was that good? I'm like, I think so. I don't know. Like, <laughs> well, you don't know because you, you, while you're doing it, you're so just into the – Conversation. Know, conversation and then thinking about what you're going to ask them next that you don't really know how it comes across as a whole package um but it also helps like the athletes that we've got on last week like they're so open and honest um and that makes your life so much easier yeah 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 well so we'll do something like that moose what do you got coming up well i'm in lockdown down in anglesey (laughs) surgery appointment on wednesday so i'll let you know how that goes and um, hopefully I can run a bit more this week because I might do a th- session on Friday. There's the Luzanne Diamond League. That's on 26th of August. I haven't seen start list for that yet, but hopefully there's some Australians there. And still four Diamond Leagues to go after that. Paralympics is kicking off this week as well. Uh, next week's going to be our 200th episode, fellas. You were just telling me off air, Moose, that 200 means nothing. I was up and about thinking I was pretty <laughs> proud we made it at 200, but then you just cut me no, straight down. No, I said no one cares about 200 I episodes. care that we've survived and got to 200 episodes. Is that, a, is that a benchmark it's amount? It's a significant number, isn't it? There's way more than 200 episodes because we've done like different shows and stuff. There's more than but 200 we do uploads. One... Yeah, but if you go once a week, 200's nothing. 200's what, like four and something years? That's a, it? yeah, well, it's of, gonna be, that's a lot well, it's of It's going to be four years. Yeah, it's going to be four years. We started pretty much just after Berlin 2017. So that was like October, yeah, yeah. October four 2017. I reckon that's a more significant than just a random number, like 200. You think four years is? Four years, yeah. The yearly, the yearly anniversary is more significant than, than just a number. Imagine, than a whole of, number. imagine the amount of hours we've spent doing this stuff. Jeez. Yeah, too imagine many. What I, imagine what I could have been doing with my life. Too many hours. Uh, I could have written. You them. love it, Brady. You love it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't love it. No, I don't know. You were just talking about how impressed you are with these interviewees, Crooks. You sound like you're up and about. Oh, I'm proud oh. that we've got to 200. I well, just started with a little yeah. bit of an idea. We haven't. Like, yeah, true. Next week. True. I was thinking about retiring at 200 as well and bringing Nick Earl in, but I kind of put that idea on the back burner a bit. Anyway, listen. You know where he'll go? He'll go well on inside jogging. Oh, you reckon? Try send him over. Send him over there because they have twelve listeners, and, and then, that's where and he does put his best. Put on road to nowhere. Oh yeah. Oh, that's yeah, good. Yeah, that could be a good idea. I don't mind that. Joel, Clousey, and Ali. That it, would actually be quite good. I reckon Clousey get up for that. Ali actually told me at Launceston when I was there that she likes listening to Clousey as well when he was on road to yeah. Valencia. So they could work good together. Got to get rid of those boring fucksies around and get him on our show. Because with we the should, right we should people, we should ring him around. on Wednesday, Crooks. We'll ring Clousey. See what he's doing. Mm, what, uh, no, he just ran sixty-three middle of the night, won't it? See that? Yeah, yeah he just ran sixty-three. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's pretty good run, Clousey. He's doing Berlin in a couple of weeks. We'll definitely get him. We'll call him one week, Crooks. We've got four more weeks while there's roads know where people are away to call people. Yeah, I don't think he'd be too impressed if, if we call him at what it's going to be like three in the morning. <laughs> Sometimes he gets up at four in the morning to go running. Anyway, I'm talking too much about Clousey. Hey, listeners, though, if you like what we've done in the first 200 episodes, uh, bang us an iTunes review. We'll read some out on air next week. Only make them, like, make them interesting, though, funny. Give us five stars, and then we'll um, read our favourites out next week in the 200th <laughs> episode. Five stars. Make five stars, and then rip into us in the comments. Like, tell, us, tell us some of your highlights of the first 200 episodes. Uh, interview fellas, Jared Clifford. They would have heard the promo with him last week about the Paralympics. This is like a bit of an interview we did beforehand. 
Um, it was the same day. So the introduction is going to sound exactly the same as last week, but then this is a bit of a chat about his training. Uh, we talked about like some of the para funding in there, the recovery and the like, build-up for the marathon that he accidentally ran, and then his hopes going into the Paralympics for the uh, 1500, the 5K, and the marathon is in action on August 28th. August 31st, and then September the 5th with Michael Roger for the marathon. So I hope you enjoy this one. And then we'll uh, do it all again next week, fellas. Anything else I need to say before we're done? No, have a good week. Same to you. Do a lockdown live. Talk to you Wednesday, Croaks. Yeah, get on that Apple Plus. Get on Ted Lasso. I've been telling you about this for a few weeks now. I've got plenty of Netflix shows. Ah, but they're not the same quality. Have you got Have you got Apple Plus, Moose? I don't even know what that is. It's just like the Apple's version of Netflix. Apple version of Netflix. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's good. There's some good TV shows on there. You know what movie I watched last night? Oh, what'd you watch? Romeo Must Die. Is it good? It's one of my... I named my first dog. Uh, you know, my Twitter handle... Oh, my Instagram Yeah, Romeo handle. the Moose. Yeah, come after my dog, which I named after Romeo Must Die, which was the movie I was watching, which was like... It's got DMX in it, Jet Li. Oh, yeah. It's got a, a, Aaliyah. Do you know Aaliyah? No. She, she died. She died. Do you know what movie we watched on the weekend? Oh, yeah, I do, actually, because you're asking about it. No, it wasn't. Once upon oh. a, It wasn't one of those two. We had two options, but we we steered away from that. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You seen that? Oh, yeah. That's crazy, yeah. that movie. That's yeah. a great movie, isn't it? That's a Tarantino flick, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a really good movie. I quite enjoyed yeah. that. Listeners, you haven't seen that one? Have a look at that one. See you guys next week. See you, hey, guys. All right, welcome back to the Inside Running Podcast. This is a uh, friend of the show. He's been on before, episode 114, Jared Clifford. Welcome to the Inside Running Podcast. Welcome back to the Inside Running Podcast. Yeah, no, thanks for having me back. Um, It's always a pleasure to be on. Episode 114, that was a while ago as well, but listeners would have heard you on episode 147 when you uh, were a guest interviewer of Noel Thatcher. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. Noel Thatcher is one of the legends of Paralympic distance running and uh, definitely uh, one of the reasons why this this next couple of uh, minutes is going to be pretty epic. He's like the forefigure of Paralympic running and I think that's the reason why Paralympic running is in a really good place globally. Yeah, and whereabouts are you joining us from today? I'm in Cairns and it's two weeks today that we're talking uh, until my race in Tokyo uh, and a week till we leave. Your first race in Tokyo, where uh, yeah. of potentially four. <laughs> yeah, yeah, potentially four, which is uh, going to be crazy, but I, um, I think I'm ready for it. I looked at the schedule this morning, we'll jump straight into it, and then we'll go back and talk about some things that you've been doing uh, the past six, 12 months. But um, yep. August 28th, your first race is a 5K straight final. I've got that right? Straight final, yeah. Okay, and then the 30th, so two days later, you got a 1,500-meter heat. Yeah, and the heats sometimes get cancelled depending on uh, uh, which countries bring the athletes that have qualified. I was going to ask that. So when you had the yeah. world champs a couple of years ago in Dubai, wasn't it? Did you have yeah. did you have heats then, or was that a straight final? Yeah, yeah, straight final. The last time they had heats in uh, Paralympics and stuff like that was London twenty twelve, and they basically make the qualifiers hard enough so that they don't always need heats, just because there's obviously so many events at the Paralympic Games, and just to limit the number of people in the village. Yeah, right. So we'll yeah. see. We'll see. We're not sure yet. Well, I don't know when we find out. Yeah, I was but... about to ask when you'd find out because that could really change. I guess because the finals are day after the thirty first. Yeah, thirty first, and that's strange as well, isn't it? That you'd have a final the day after the the heat because wasn't the Olympics just gone? Like Shuey and that had a couple of days between their fifteen hundred. Yeah, I was talking to the uh, cerebral palsy guys in our team and Dion and Dan Bounty, and they were saying how it's funny the Olympic guys had a day off in between their heat and final, but the the para athletes we don't need a day off. <laughs> maybe they went maybe because they went heat semi then final. I think so. Yeah, I think that is why. Yeah, that, honest, maybe yeah. that could be, yeah, I don't know. These schedules, I don't know how people, it would do my head in trying to oh. make all this work. It takes a special yeah. human being to do this job. I think so. And then uh, after the 1500 metre final, you'll have 
four days off and on the fifth day you'll run the marathon september the 5th yeah it's an interesting one i know uh definitely wasn't on my plan until uh penrith when i ran the one by accident uh but the four days off will actually mean that it's an easier week leading in to this one than the one in Penrith. So uh, hopefully it'll, I'll, I'll feel a little bit fresher on the start line. Yeah, I don't mind this program. I reckon you can pull, it, pull off this triple. I, I, I think it's doable. The 5K is my best event, uh, even though I'm not the world record holder in that one. It's just the one that I'm probably strongest at at the moment. And uh, there's probably less variables and... In the 1500, there's a lot of guys coming up from the 800 with some really fast PBs. So if it gets down to the last lap, uh, there's a lot more that could happen. So I think the way it's set out is, you know, tick to hopefully tick the box in the 5K, um, which sets up the rest of the comp. And will you be a guy that will like, take a lot of confidence from that as well? Like you bang a gold straight out in the first event and then you're, you're on, on a cloud for the rest of it? Oh, I think so. I, I've been in the high-performance system longer than most people, particularly in distance running. I, I entered the high-performance system with Athletics Australia when I was 12. Uh, and basically, my entire career has been leading up to Tokyo. I remember sitting in an office when I was 14 or 15 and being told that I'd been, quote, earmarked for Tokyo. Uh, so basically, ticking that box is ticking off, you know, the biggest thing in my whole life a gold medal at the Paralympic Games. Honestly, whatever happens after that, if I can do that in the 5K, is just a bonus um, because it would just mean so much. And once I've ticked that box off, it nearly feels like I'll be able to take a deep breath and, like, I'll have a new lease on life just because everything's been geared towards this moment. So um, it'll be really – it'll be like a massive weight off the shoulders to to tick off the box early. And with that 5K, like, two weeks out, how's the um, competition looking, do you know? It's going to be strong. And this is the thing with Paralympic running that a lot of people are astounded by. I've raced my competitors in the 5,000 metres once since Rio five years ago. Uh, I haven't seen results from my African rivals in two years. Uh, There will be people on the start list, probably from Ethiopia and Kenya, whose names have never popped up on world rankings lists, uh, who have no result to their name that I can find. And I'll probably be standing on the start line not actually knowing if I'm the quickest. Uh, I've run forward in 04 and forward in 02 in recent weeks in pretty much, not solo particularly, but time trials. Um, No no one else is racing the race. Uh, And I'm pretty confident I'm in some pretty crazy 5K shape at the moment. So that's why I'm most confident for the 5, because if it's fast, I, I believe I can go with it. And then I know my last lap's strong. The best, the, the, the rivals that I know most, uh, Elamin Shantou from Morocco, he's run a 13.53 before he's the world record holder, but uh, the way he ran that race, you know, he went out really hard, so he's probably a 13.35 uh, type guy. Whether he's in that form still, that was quite a while ago now, but Kenya's super strong, Morocco's super strong, uh, Tunisia and Russia. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, Paralympics running is so unpredictable. It's interesting, though, because we sit back, and when I say we, I mean, like, you know, followers of Athletics Australia and listeners to this podcast, almost assuming that you're going to come home with a couple of gold medals, like, because we don't know any of these other athletes, or you're kind of like, you know, Australia's favourite para-athlete in a way, like, (laughs) and there there must be a lot of pressure on you, like, because you know all these, what you just said then, like, these these guys that are in sub-14 shape and guys you've never heard of before that come from strong distance running countries. Yeah. Um, but we don't. We just assume that you're going to go over there and win gold medals. Yeah, no, there's a lot of pressure. And that's why I'm, I, I like coming on shows like this when I know the distance running community is listening and they'll understand once I say it because definitely the gold medal isn't a guarantee. World champs uh, at a para-athletic level is quite strong, but it is nowhere near as strong as Paralympic level because uh, a lot of the African countries will actually send their strongest runners to the Paralympic Games. Uh, Paralympic sport in a lot of those countries is only just beginning to go through a massive surge uh, and they actually bother looking for people with visual impairments in Kenya, you know, leading up to a Paralympic Games. Um, So, uh, yeah, basically no gold is a guarantee Um, and and I know that from first-hand experience watching my training partner Michael Rogo in the Army amputee, 1,500 metres, he's been the world record holder since 2000 and I think 13, 2014, and he, he's 
uh, he's moved to the marathon now. He, he's never won a 1,500-meter global title, world champs or Paralympic Games. So world records don't matter. Uh, to be honest, even in my 1,500 time, the guys that I'm coming up against in that, there's a chance they've run quicker than me and I just haven't found out. The world record hasn't gone public or they've kept it quiet. Like that is possible in Paralympic sport. And why is it that they support the Olympics so much more than like the world parachamps or the Paralympics more than the parachamps? I think it's, oh, I think, you know, this is why, if you think about it, Paralympic Games, uh, they really started in 1964. And to be honest, it was probably a similar starting point to 1896, the Olympic Games, because uh, there was only, you know, a handful of countries, a lot of the people that were competing wouldn't call themselves professional athletes that were training full time. Uh, and since 1964, what's that? That's, that's like 50 ish years. Yeah. Um, 50 years on from the start of the Olympic Games, uh, the representation around the world was growing, but definitely the African dominance in distance running didn't quite get going until I think the 60s or 70s. So I think Paralympic sport is probably at that point. It's uh, a lot of countries are only just starting to debut at the Paralympic Games. Um, Kenya and Ethiopia have been there for a long time, but uh, the strength is in the depth that they're beginning to show now. For instance, in my category, the 1500 meters and 5000 meters, an African runner has won every time since Sydney 2000. So to say that they're not, uh, to say that they're coming strong now is actually, I guess, a disservice because they've always been dominant, but it's just the depth that's changed. Yeah, okay. And then I'm assuming this depth would continue over into the marathon, like your last event? Yeah, the marathon's super, super strong. Um, I got the world record, but often, you know, in Australia, we have the ability to ratify world records a lot easier. Uh, and a lot of the times that have been put down in the marathon are done at the London Marathon, where the para-athletes get their own race. Um and it's, yeah, often there's no paces or anything like that. Or they're done at Paralympic Games when it's quite hot usually and not the best conditions. So there's a couple of guys that are running low 220s, a couple of Japanese fellas that are running potentially sub 220. So the marathon's going to be quite difficult. And obviously for me, like the goal is just to survive it. Uh, I'm not training for it specifically. I'm just trying to, uh, I guess, fluke, fluke it again. But yeah. Um, yeah, but honestly, like, that's a thing. Like, I think I can. The way I felt in that marathon in Paris, which I guess we'll get to later, yeah, I feel like I, I could do it. So it's going to be um, it's going to be full on. Yeah, well, let's go there now. So you run the tan, the race around the tan, Botanical Gardens in Melbourne the day before. You then fly up to Sydney for the Athletics Australia kind of uh, marathon to pace your good mate and training partner, Michael Roger. And then you uh, end up finishing after a bit of a sit-down after your pacemaker <laughs> duties were done. You run 2.19.08, which is, you know, a phenomenal time. I don't think you had many jowls or drinks or anything like that. You didn't put in any long runs or anything beforehand. And then you bang out a time like that. Amazing. Yeah, it was a crazy time. I hadn't, yeah. I think, you know, coming off the track season, um, you know, it was a really good track season for me. I ran 3.41, metres, um, which is... Well, you also ran nine, ever you ran nine 1.500 metres during the season. Like, every single time there was a race on, I saw you <laughs> I saw you going around on my stream back here in the Duke of Miami. Yeah, I threw myself in every race. Uh, it, and then, you know, honestly, I was in a weird headspace. I'd probably done a couple of weeks before. I'd probably only run 40 or 50 k's a week just because my pa, who I was really close to, had passed away. And I oh, think sorry Renz, to hear that. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's what happens, I guess. And... Um, but yeah, you know, he was someone that always rang me about my running, and um, and I think mentally I was just in a weird spot as we closed off that season, and uh, it was nearly like not not like I was being reckless or anything, but I think I was trying to work out what what parts of running like I love the most, and my squad uh, is like a family to me, and Philo, the way he creates this atmosphere is that like we'd do you know anything to help others in our team and like if we we win together and we lose together and when rogues you know this marathon like i've seen what he's put himself through over the last decade and like i like we want to see him do well in tokyo and i knew this was a big race for him and um i was pretty ready to go uh to the ends of the earth to try and get him as far as possible but yeah the week leading in was weird like i did national 1500 did okay um 
That's and right. Made it through to the. You got through the. I missed the final. Just, just, yeah. Yeah. Point two. Point That's two. right. You're coming down the home straight, um, closing really hard, like dipping. I was, yeah, I was trying. I, I've come fourth in my heat twice, but um, it's yeah. And then I did uni nationals, uh, and then I did um, not much running. Yeah. Then I did the tan in Melbourne, which was a, a great event put on by the guys there that uh, we've now got para records, para all timers. So shout out to them. But yeah, then travelled up to to Sydney and. Um, yeah, it all happened. It was crazy, crazy day. So what was the plan beforehand, though? Like, was the conversation to get to half or get to 25 or 30 or, like, did you, in the back of your mind, did you ever think you were going to go the whole way? I didn't know I was going to go the whole way, and I can swear on my life on this until Philo told me to finish. Uh, I actually sat on my bed that morning and, like, talked to myself and said to myself, like, I have to, like, bury myself to get to halfway because I hadn't done any long sessions no longer I think I'd done like one 30k run in January maybe uh, my weeks were averaging about 100 to 105 110 maybe um, so I, I was honestly worried I wouldn't even make it that far um, in terms of nutrition I had a gel on the on the start um, and then I probably had one sip of Morton when Philo because uh, I can't see my bottles like I, even if I had bottles like I wouldn't have been able to see them so uh, I was basically just a filler. Filler gave me a drink at like 15k, and we were just running, I think, three 15s. And I just, it's 5k laps at that course. And for me, visually, it was like the best course because it was out and back, straight line. I could have closed my eyes. And then there was this one tough bit where I'd then like go behind Rogues and uh, Nick Earl, and I'd basically just follow their feet around that and then swing back past as soon as it, I knew I could run freely. And yeah, it was just one of those days where I guess because I wasn't focusing on myself because if I ha- if I did start feeling bad, I could have just pulled out. Uh, and so I was, wasn't really analysing it so in depth that I just, I don't know, I just never felt bad. And I was going to pull out at about 30, uh, I think, because I started to think it would get a bit silly if I went further. And you but still felt wrote, okay? Like 30K at 315, 316s is pretty, pretty honest. I felt so good. Yeah, it was the most... It's one of the best feelings I've ever had in running. It was just so rhythmic. Uh, I just was so in the zone. And I was carrying Rogues' water bottle for about a K each lap. Obviously, Rogues, with the one uh, one hand, with you know, if he's having a gel, he can't hold his bottle at the same time. So I was helping him out with that. And then um, Rogues started to cramp, which he gets in a lot of marathons. And I was kind of thinking to myself, there's not much point pulling out if I'm still feeling good at the moment. He probably needs someone the most because... I guess that's when they everyone says the race starts. And I was like, I'll do another lap just, I don't know, just to get him another 5K. Uh, and then, I, yeah, I got to 36, which is where everyone was standing, and I sat down. I was pretty pretty happy to be finished. Like, I was still feeling, like, real good. But um, I don't know. I it, it was also Rogues' marathon, so I didn't, um, like, it was his race. And I don't know, I thought I'd get in trouble from people at AA and, stuff like that if I finished a marathon out of nowhere. Uh, so I kind of stopped and sat down for, I think it was 28 seconds on my Strava. Um, and Philo ran over to me and basically told me to get up and even just jog and I could break the world record. And basically if I didn't do it, I might regret it. So um, my, I think my fastest K of the race was the next K. But sitting down definitely stuffed my stomach up and uh, the last 5K definitely wasn't as comfortable as the first 36 um, and that's why I was pretty cooked when I crossed the line, I think. What was the world record before your 2.19? Officially, and this is the fastest time I've managed to find even unofficially, 2.21.30. But I reckon the guy that did that, if he didn't do it, he would have been capable of quicker, and I still reckon there could be a time out there that I haven't found. But, yeah. Yeah, the ratification of the record sounds really um, interesting, I suppose, in para sports. Yeah, and that's why I promote it when I break one because I think until the rest of the world jumps on that and values the world records properly, then this will just keep happening. And I think until we make it a really cool thing to break a world record, which we've done in Australia, um, then I don't think the guys around the world will care. Like, I I want it to be a real thing. So um, that's why I I get around uh, when Rose or myself or Dion in the past have broken world records. Yeah, well, it gets media and stuff as well, and then it gets people talking about running and publicity yeah. and all that kind of like that's 
you know, sometimes in Australia, Australia we've got this like tall poppy syndrome where we cut things like that down. But I think it's actually a good thing that people are talking about our sport and know what's going on. And yeah, yeah any publicity right. is good kind of publicity and distance running. That's what I reckon. And and for para sport too, like, uh, you know, it's funny. People will look at my times and think I'm one of the quickest visually impaired runners in the history of our sport. And obviously I, I am because I'm a male, uh, but the best visually impaired runner of all time is still Marla Runyon. She was a T12 athlete as well, same category as me, and she came eighth at the Sydney, Sydney or Atlanta? I think it was Sydney 2000 Olympic Games. Uh, she's like a 402 or 403, 1500 meter runner. And, you know, we don't really know about that for some reason. And that's, you know, she's a runner that is one of the greatest runners on, of all time. On. Visually impaired and she was in the Olympics. And yeah, she ran 403 that... for 1500. Yeah, this is what I mean. Like, yeah, people don't like, know these stories. I've done 197 um, episodes talking about running in Australia and, and yeah. didn't know this at all until you just told so, me. Yeah, so, well, actually, let me clarify. I might have not said. She's actually American, not Australian. Oh, but okay. it's yep. still a story. Still, it's, yeah. it's still a story that, like, speaks volumes about, you know, because people see my times uh, and sometimes their initial reaction is, well, you know, the vision impairment must not impact uh, that badly if he's able to run 341. Yeah. One, that comes from a pretty ignorant place. But two, my time compared to that, it's not even equivalent at all. Like there are runners in our history, in Paralympic history, that are quick, uh, really impressive athletes, and um, and she's one of them. And I and I think stories like that and and pumping up times make people realise that the Paralympics is no joke. Like this is real competition. A gold medal, we don't get handed gold medals. Australia's won three gold medals, I think, in Paralympic distance running in history, and which is actually less than the Olympic Games. And just and I think it's just because, you know, we're in such a golden era of Australian Paralympic running with Rogues, myself, Dion, et cetera, that people kind of think Australia must just dominate. And it's it's that's actually not not how it has been in the past. So uh, it's super exciting, I think, leading into Tokyo. Yeah, yeah, summarise that well. But back to this marathon, um, tell us about your recovery. I know we spoke about it on the podcast and then we had a few messages with you about <laughs> we were concerned because, you know, we, yeah. we all know how hard it is, a marathon is in your body and how sometimes hard it is to bounce back afterwards. And, like, we were stoked that you ran that time, but we're also really worried that it was going to impact possibly your preparation for uh, the Paralympics and, like, the big goals, I suppose. Yeah, no, that's it. Like, um I think the reason, I think there were, you know, around the running community, there would have been queries as to Philo's decision-making to tell me to finish. Uh, but I guess 36K versus 42 is not a huge difference. But um, oh, I'd say it's a, uh, from a guy who crumbles in the last 6K <laughs> last marathons, I would say, yeah, you give me a 36K over a 42K, and I, I think there is a difference. I reckon a lot of damage potentially can be done in the last 6K, but it sounds like you got up and finished it, no worries. Yeah, I guess that's definitely – yeah, no, that is true. I think um, from my just purely perspective from outside the marathon, yeah, no, you, you're definitely right. But I think Philo's decision-making is often contextualised uh, to the athlete. Uh, I've never had an injury in my career ever. Um, I've been running 140 up to 150K weeks since I was 17, I'm um, 22 now, so it's been a pretty long, uninterrupted stint, which doesn't mean you can do a marathon, but it definitely means my body has shown resilience, and I think that's how he justified knowing that I could do it. Um, and then we backed it off, so I took three days off. Uh, I was definitely sore, but it wasn't as sore as I thought I could have been. Uh, and then I jogged for a few days, and then I started doing sessions with the slower athletes in our group and Philo basically and we were in parish as well so I went to altitude within six or seven days but um yeah basically Philo was like I see you one step in front of whoever I'd been assigned to that day uh then I'd have to take a week off um so I basically eased into it but within I think less than two weeks I did uh I uh, was it a 20 minute threshold at three tens at Perisher? So I was feeling pretty good afterwards, but we definitely didn't hit any speed work for quite a while. So I don't know how I managed to do it. I don't know if it's the shoes. Uh, I don't know if it's something to do with my body. Uh, maybe the marathon's what I'm suited to down the track. I'm, I actually have no idea. 
Yeah, because it didn't uh, it didn't seem to impact much of your like or just even the last couple of months, like a fourteen oh four, a fourteen oh nine, and a fourteen oh two. This fourteen oh two the other week, two forty eight, two forty nine, two fifty one, two fifty two, two thirty nine. Just a uh, decent kick <laughs> down there. Yeah, I think I think that was the thing. Like I, it was funny. Like the reaction from people at Athletics Australia in the Paris space was very much um, like congrats. Um, like, are we allowed to be excited about this? Because um, I guess there were queries whether it was high performance, but my retort to that would be, well, it was a world record. So I guess, I don't know. It, it, it's not, maybe it's could have, it's definitely a risk, and I'm not going to like say it wasn't a risk, but, um, but, but arguably the marathon c- could have been if I was to focus on my safest bet of a gold medal. Um, obviously, I haven't done that, but it's funny how like you're either a track runner or a marathon runner like and um the reaction was very much you can't commit to even uh running the marathon as a afterthought at the games until you prove that you've recovered well and i ran a 1404 in june as well so uh, i think that's when i was given the permission um (laughs) to go ahead with it which is yeah your range is unbelievable like 341 um, fourteen oh two. Is your ten your best ten k still that one we did in Bendigo that time trial, like twenty yeah. twenty ish? Yep. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And it then two nineteen oh eight. Like, there's a lot of distance runners out there that would kill for those PBs to have that kind of range from fifteen all the way up to the marathon. And yeah, it's all been I, recent. Like, all that's happened in the last twelve months. Yeah, it's crazy. I think. Uh, yeah, I think because I I keep saying it's a fluke like the marathon but philo says like, there's no flukes in running i think no nah, and you like, can't fluke a marathon like it's 42k you may have yeah. the first 15k or 20k but it will find you out yeah i don't know i'm definitely going into tokyo uh, in terms of my thinking on the marathon and just because i've done it once there's no there's no indication it means i can do it again obviously tokyo is going to be tougher conditions uh this time i'll know at the start that i'm finishing because i remember in Penrith thinking at 15k you know, shit, we've been running a while, uh, like stuff, stuff doing a full marathon. We're not even halfway. Um, and obviously, yeah, I didn't realize I was in the middle of one, but now I'll, I'll know at the 15K mark that I'm still got, you know, quite a long way to go. So psychologically, it's going to be different and physically it's going to be different. So um, that's why I'm just treating it as a bonus. If it goes terribly, hopefully I've executed on the track. So that's my yeah. thinking. And at the Paralympics, will you use the same marathon course that the Olympics used up in Sapporo? Nah, so we're in Tokyo. So everyone, if, if they do have a stream, at least on the app, uh, they'll be able to see what the course would have been if the oh, Olympic Also, you're, on, had you're on the original Tokyo. course. What's yeah. The, so is we, it going to be so much hotter though or is it going to cool down a bit in two weeks? Cooling down a little bit, but not in, like yeah, not heaps. But Sapporo ended up being yeah. super hot, so it'll it probably be similar conditions to that. Um, so yeah, we finish and start and finish in the stadium, which is exciting. And then with the marathon, this is what I sometimes get a bit confused with with para sports. Yes, you, you, we might say you know twenty, thirty. I'm not sure you'll be able to tell me. Fifty people go off the start line, but you directly won't be competing against all of those guys. Yeah, so we're still waiting to hear whether there's going to be staggered starts. They may stagger each category by 10 minutes. Oh, because um, they do that at London, don't they? Yeah, so like at the para guys, we get like a half an hour start at London, I think, uh, or something like that. And yeah, so uh, for for Rogues and I, uh, ideally, I don't think we'll be starting at the same time. And yeah, we race our own categories. So it's the same as pretty much on the track. Like we race against people with similar disabilities to us. Um, which I guess, yeah, I can get into um, as part of a para preview later on. But, yeah, it's uh, basically you're just racing. And, yeah, I won't be looking at running the time or anything like that. Yeah, I think we saw that last weekend, didn't we, with the Olympics. Um, you're not going to, unless you keep Chogi. Yeah. He's about the only one that put down a super fast time over there. Yeah. Well, we actually spoke. Um, Philo's really good mates with Michael Shelley. Yep. Uh, so Rogues and I had a, like a sit-down chat over the phone with Shelley and just kind of spoke about uh, like running in the heat and running to feel um, and just like backing yourself and being confident and not having any doubts um, and just kind of nearly feeling like you're just going for a long run that first few Ks, like like on the start line, like don't hype yourself too much, um, especially when it's like so important not to go out too hard. So to hear from, you know, a, a legend like Shelley has run quite a few hot marathons was pretty pretty special 
And you must have taken a lot from um, last weekend as well, like seeing how the girls in particular on the Saturday, mm. kind of their race strategies and how that panned out for them. Yeah, definitely. Like I think, I think that's it's. I've taken a lot seeing like how those girls went, and Liam especially too. Like I think it shows, um, and particularly me when I have to protect myself a lot more than someone that's trained for the marathon. It just shows that good results come from patience at the start. So. Um, I'm definitely going to try and be as patient as possible. What about um, this build-up? So you've been a busy man. I've, I was I sent you through a screenshot the other day. I was just getting the stream ready to watch some, uh, I think it was the 1,500-metre heats at work. A little uh, logged on to the Channel 7 website, a little pop-up ad pops up, and it's a picture of you and Tim Logan all dressed up in a Nike promo <laughs> ad. And then I'm sitting down watching the 1500-meter final on free air TV, and you've got a little ad popping up there as well. So it's been a bit of media behind you. Yeah, it's crazy. It's um, it's definitely out of my comfort zone in a lot of ways, but it's also something that I've wanted to see for so long, and I've seen it with people like Kurt Fernley and Dylan Alcott. But um, yeah, like Paralympic sport has so much story in it, but so much spectacle just as a normal uh, Olympic competition has and I think like for corporate businesses to tap into that it's silly not to um, and and like honestly I approached Nike a couple of years ago and they jumped on board straight away but to get to this point where they're super invested now in the Paralympic movement um, not just through me but through others is super special and um, yeah the ads are crazy uh, and to have Timmy, like I think um, people will watch me running solo on the track and they probably don't get a grasp of my impairment. But Timmy and I are basically inseparable for the last almost 10 years because for me, like I can't train often without using him as a cue um, for safety even, uh, even just daily living skills off the track, off running. Um, he's traveling around Australia and traveling around the world with me uh, and to have him in that ad with me is super special because when I think people with low vision understand the, re- the reliance on others and that idea of being vulnerable, which we spoke about, you know, I have to trust him. I have to trust others with my life often. So um, it's the bonds between myself and him is like incredible and it's actually unfortunate but – Timmy's had a few injuries and he won't be able to guide me in, in the 5,000 metres, um, which he's done in the past. Uh, I'm having to do that solo just because um, I can do it solo. Like guiding in that is usually more tactical and information. But, uh, yeah, he's just not quite in the shape we need. But for the marathon, he'll be all good to go. And my other guide there is Vincent Donadieu. And, I, like, I think I'm stoked that um, guide runners are getting, like eh, – such a good rap too because they're you know, I, I can't I can't train at the level I want to train at without people like Tim so it's pretty special yeah and I know like obviously knowing Tim from years of AV kind of cross country stuff and track stuff it was cool to see his face popping up in the promos yeah. as well and all dressed up there and you guys just yeah. look like you're having so much fun like every photo is just smiling I don't know about the clothing choices clearly yeah. you guys didn't pick that stuff out yourself did you you're no, we didn't, dressed no. up in like we it looks like you're just... sometimes and we were like geez like I hope I hope we don't cop too much flack for some of this. <laughs> what about, it looks like you're in a dressing gown at one stage, but then with a pair of like alpha flies on. I'm just like, yeah. These, well, some, even, these uh, we had cool a cup people. Of tea. Yeah, yeah, a cup of tea there too. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting, but it was pretty cool. They hired out some mansion. Uh, did went into a recording studio. Had like like a massive film crew down at our local track in Greensboro in Melbourne, Diamond Valley. So it was pretty special. And um, yeah, they painted up this like portrait of the track that we've trained at since like 2013 so like that's super special too yeah it's it's cool to hear that behind the scenes stuff as well because we see this like 60 minute tv ad and you see like five photos and then you're like oh yeah it takes you know a <laughs> stack of people and effort to kind of put this kind of quality of stuff out oh yeah it's crazy just to see that like the photos took hours and then like there's only you know they pick out like half a dozen it's, it's like insane <laughs> what about the old um the spotify playlist as well i listened to that the other day How yeah, it's got like, do you guys choose the tracks it's got like different tracks but then in between like every fourth or fifth song it's got um like a an audio bit of you guys talking about stuff yeah that was um a request 
kind of by me because um, in the vision impaired community, there's like a massive push at the moment to have like a voiceover in ads um, and voiceover in like even films, but that you can like click on the TV to choose. And I think the ABC is doing it so that there's like, they're like describing what's on the screen as well as the audio. And uh, that's why the ad has me like talking in it. But then I also kind of floated the idea of having some kind of audio storytelling as well. And so Spotify jumped on board, which was super cool. Uh, and basically, uh, that's why there's like some really cool sound effects. So they had like these sound, like people that literally specialize in sound, just like following us around for ages um, and picking up background noise. But yeah, then we recorded that stuff and the tracks, to be honest, I didn't choose them, but oh, I'm pretty happy. I was about I'm pretty to give happy you credit for that. I know, no, I, I probably should have just pretended that. Yeah. I'm pretty stoked with it, actually. There was a bit of, yeah, well, I was stoked. I got some here because I've written some of the, the bangers down. So Northeast Party House was there, Rufus De Soul, a bit of Cub Sport, a bit of Birds. It was good. I was saving some to my playlist. I was like, yes, Jared and Tim, this is good. <laughs> but now, yeah, I, I can't claim it. Yeah, you should definitely be claiming that for now. Well, we might edit that out, make it sound yeah, a bit yeah, more yeah, hip yeah, than you are. Yeah, really. <laughs> um, so that's been good. And that's, yeah, obviously that promo and stuff around the parasports is pretty important. And one of my last questions for you before we kind of um, do preview the para Olympics, which is going to be kicking off next week, is around that word vulnerability. Like everything I kind of read in some of the media I've done recently, I know um, Hugh Van Kylenberg's often talking about vulnerability, Brené Brown kind of thing, but it definitely seems like it's a bit of a theme. You've adapted in the last kind of six to 12 months. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, my, my story in a nutshell is basically, you know, I have a visual impairment, but for me it's normal. Uh, like this is how I've grown up. But you still know you're different. And when I was a kid, like, and I think most people will understand this feeling, is that you don't want to stand out. You don't want to be different. And, like, for me that led to not for very long, but, like, there were moments where I didn't really embrace who I was, I guess, even at points like being ashamed, like it's a strong word. I definitely didn't feel like it like relentlessly, but there were moments like that. Um, and this idea of asking for help was a sign of weakness, was definitely something that I guess subscribed to as a kid. Um, and that's why I struggled to function at school properly, just because I was rebelling against offers of help, like literally technological help. Uh, personal assistant help that would like allow me to do school properly and then also not be tired uh, so that I could then do sport as well so you know I didn't ask for help and the idea of vulnerability is that being vulnerable and actually accepting and embracing that because everyone has vulnerabilities and everyone has adversities uh, that idea is then that once you accept that you can actually ask for help and asking for help is a sign of strength because uh, you know Elliot Kipchoge says this in a different way, but it's like the team, like people united and people working together is so much stronger than, than one person. And like I know lots of people with disabilities, particularly my community uh, with visual impairments and blindness, uh, our reliance on others uh, is huge. And like our safety, but also our quality of life uh, our ability to not just do one thing and then be cooked for the rest of the day relies on and help from others. And, and until we accept that we are vulnerable uh, in, in some contexts, then I don't think we will get the best out of life like that. And I think that lesson applies so easily to everyone's life because no one's life's easy. There's like shit going on in everyone's life. Um, and, and I think until people kind of like ask for help and be okay with that and like not think it's a sign of weakness um then like yeah like so that's what society needs basically so that's kind of where i come from and i think like the paralympics is a place where that lesson is shown in every sport on every day that you'll watch it on tv society needs it more than more than ever at the moment too with the current uh, the situation which has been going yeah. on for like a year and a half but um yeah. yeah and then like on the paralympics like how do you feel the um the hype score because i think when the olympics hit that was like a bit of hope in a lot of people's lives you know something you can stay mm. up for and watch and you're like oh 
I can't do much in my own life at the moment with all these lockdowns and restrictions and things like that. But you got to watch, you know, Australian athletes running at, against the best in the world every every night. It felt like someone was in a final. Yeah. And then we've kind of had this week and a half, two week break, and now it's your turn. Yeah, it's super exciting. I mean, I, one thing when the Olympics finished, you know, a lot of people because there'd been such a, I think, particularly in Australia, like a quite popular Olympics in the end, yeah, just because I think so. So many people were watching, and, and and it gave people, yeah, as you said, hope and something to cheer on. And Australia did so well, but like you know, people were sad, like that the Olympics were finishing, and you know, what am I going to do now? And what I frothed was that people were getting on and going, well, hey, wait up a second, you don't have to wait three years two weeks off and we go again and uh and and i think as well that the hype like tokenistic hype of paralympics is so so in the past now and it's actually like translated to reality like the hype is not is about you know overcoming our adversities for sure because that's a huge part of it but it's like the the competition that you'll see the athletes that you'll see on your tv screens like are going to blow your mind not because wow, that guy's swimming with one arm. It's because that guy's swimming with one arm really damn quick. Yeah. Uh, and, and, like, you, you'll see it in my, my categories. And, and it's, it's, you'll see it in, distance, in the distance running. You'll be a st- There is a guy that is in the cerebral palsy coordination impairment 1,500 metres. He literally has a physical disability. He's run the 1,500 metres in 3 minutes and 47 seconds. Uh, like like the athletes, not just the stories, are going to be incredible. And the hype, I think, around it is just going to grow in the next week. Uh, opening ceremonies August 24. So um, I'm super I'm super pumped. Like I'm kind of sad. Uh, no, I'm not sad because I'm I'm pumped to compete. But in a way, like I'm I think this is going to be huge for Paralympics viewing. Like the viewing uh, experience is going to be massive. Yeah, because so many people at home. Like you see some of those numbers around. Um like Pete Bowles, 800, and Rowan Browning's, like, 100. Like, there was yeah. something like 3.8 million Australians watching that on TV. Yeah, I know. Like, that was insane to see those stats. And, like, um, yeah, like, globally, I think it's going to go up another notch. Like, I know London 2012 was huge for the Paralympics uh, in terms of global audience, too. And I think Tokyo is just going to be insane. Like, Tokyo's hype uh, domestically has been, like, like it's, it's huge. It's one of the first times they've done, like a like, a – like the their promos have been together, and which is super super cool too. Yeah, have you? Uh, I'm sure you have, but a lot of listeners might not have. But that Rising Phoenix documentary on Netflix oh, that does a pretty yeah. good job of explaining like the history of the Paralympics as well. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's a great recommendation to any listeners that are feeling like this two weeks in between the Olympics and Paralympics is going by slowly. Chuck that on on uh, one night and you'll yeah it's one of the best sports documentaries you'll watch yeah some great background there hey um last one before we preview this stuff i was looking at the um the nas funding yesterday a listener pointed this out to me and hopefully you can clarify it uh, hopefully it doesn't get too um too into numbers and stuff but the way the para sports has set it up compared to the able-bodied like it's all on the athletics australia website who's at what level but can you explain for me? So on tier one with the able body, we have one person, Kelsey Lee Barber. On mm-hmm. tier two, we have this is in able bodies. We have one person, Danny Stevens. And on tier three, we have nine people, all um, field athletes like throwers, jumpers. Yep. Um, we have nine, and then it's not until tier four for the funding do we actually see any runners. So like Stewie's there. Cat Bissett's there, Sinead's there, Lyndon Hall, Pat Tien, and all the names we talk about regularly on this podcast. But in the para category, at the tier one, we've got nine people. Tier two, we've got 10. And tier three, we've got 10. So over those first three tiers, there's a massive difference in the support para athletes get compared to able-bodied athletes. Is that because it's a different pool of funding or... Like, yeah, can you explain that to me? And even for you, like, you're obviously at that gold tier, mm-hmm. tier one, and it's, you know, you got Tim there as a guide and Philo there as a guide as well, and Rogues and um, some of these names we'll talk about in the preview. Yeah, so basically para funding and able bodies funding is separate. Uh, and uh, para funding, I believe, um, is overall actually less. But our funding also predominantly from those tiers comes from DAS, which is the basically uh, it's like D then AIS and that's basically I think from the Sports Commission. Whereas a lot of our uh, able-bodied athletes, like a lot of their NAS money outside of probably the medalists, comes from Athletics Australia. 
So um, para funding, because obviously we're in para athletics, like it's inevitable that probably we'll win more medals. We have more events as well. Um, but yeah, basically the government, I be- yeah, I believe with the sports commission and all that value a Paralympic gold medal equally to an Olympic gold medal in terms of funding. And yeah, but then our thing, like if you get top eight in a Paralympic games, there's no guarantee you'll have any financial support. You might get like institute support, whereas a top eight at an Olympic games will guarantee you, uh, or should guarantee you funding. I'm, I'm pretty certain. On the um, body side, you mean? On the able bodied yeah. side, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so even though we're concentrated at the top, our funding doesn't go deeper. Like the able bodied yeah. funding goes yeah. to. Because you look at like place. tier six, seven, eight, nine kind of thing, there's a whole lot more able bodied athletes there than um, yeah. Yeah, para ones. Yeah, I thought that was, it's kind of like a. It's um, like a flip almost, like the para-athletes are way more at the top on that those first three tiers, but then the able-bodied mm. ones, there's hardly anyone on those top three tiers. Yeah, and that's basically because, like, like I, I, you know, I was told as a junior, when I was on my first few teams, because I've been on teams since I was 16 in 2015, yeah. and, like, that's our junior pathway as well, where our junior pathway is being on the team, just probably not meddling. So, um, like, every pretty much every para-junior that's, at the level to get funding is actually probably already in those upper tiers. Um, so like they're getting their development through that. Um, but uh, in terms of the guides, it's they're mainly there, but they mainly get like institute support so they can get physio if they're injured. Like Tim's been supported quite well through his injuries, uh, for instance, yeah. Um, and oh, that's, that's, okay. that's... So, yeah, so you at Gold isn't exact. You don't get exactly the same as what Tim or Philo gets as a guide at Gold. Yeah, they don't get the same as me. Okay. Because, yeah. yeah, the listeners that point that out, they're like, you know, there's a guy on three three levels higher than what Stewie, Sinead, and Pat are on. Yeah. And I'm and, like, and, yeah, and, I don't and, think yeah. that'd be right. But I said, I'll ask Clifford when I'm talking to him next week. Yeah, and they definitely get supported because, like, even if I'm not racing with guides on the track, like, I genuinely need – like, if Phil, this is the thing. Philo's strength as a para coach when he comes over on teams with us is that he can run with us. Yeah. But say Philo gets injured and he – or he's, you know, he's 45 soon. Like, or he stops running. I don't think that'll ever happen. They say he does. Like, I don't have someone I can then train with that can then, like, help me. So even if I'm not racing, I actually need a guide to come over with me. And so, like, their support is actually important for Australia to win a gold medal. Um, But it's still, yeah, it's still definitely treated differently to me. But also, if you take funding away from para, it definitely... Uh, so if you give funding to para, it's not taking away from able-bodied because it comes from a separate place. Mm. We have separate medal tallies, uh, and medal tallies often designate funding. Um, and so our medal tally, I don't think they get combined um, or anything like that. They should do a better job. They should list that on this website because it's just yeah, a, it just says Athletes Australia NAS list. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure Like if you go into depthy reports yeah. in the Sports Commission, you can find it. Scroll to page 97 of some PDF. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, thanks for clarifying that. That helped massively. All right, mate. Well, thanks for the chat. Thanks for the update. Good luck between uh, now and getting to the start line in a couple of weeks' time. It's going to be an exciting time ahead. And, yeah, you know you've got a whole lot of fans here at the Inside Running Podcast who will be um, yelling at their TVs when it's go time. And uh, thank you, and, and thanks to all the listeners for the support. Every time I come on the show, like – um, I, I see the messages and it's really special. And thanks for Brady and, and, and the other guys, yeah, for what you guys are doing for the sport and the uh, Paralympic running too, like this preview. I reckon hopefully uh, some people have learned some stuff and uh, we'll be tuning in now a little bit more informed. And I know when you're informed, it's a lot more enjoyable to watch too. So, Thank you again to this episode's sponsor, New Balance. With all the comfort and stability for you to run the distance, Fresh Foam X is New Balance's premium collection of their most elite fresh foam running shoes, which are available at select retailers and newbalance.com.